by Sir Walter Scott. Rob Roy. For why? Because the good old rule sufficeth them. The simple plan, that they should take who have the power, and they should keep who can. Rob Roy's grave. Wordsworth. When the editor of the following volumes published, about two years since, the work called Antiquary, he announced that he was, for the last time, intruding upon the public in his present capacity. He might shelter himself under the plea that every anonymous writer is, like the celebrated Junius, only a phantom, and that therefore, although an apparition, of a more benign as well as much meaner description, he cannot be bound to plead to a charge of inconsistency. A better apology may be found in the imitating the confession of honest Benedict, that, when he said he would die a bachelor, he did not think he should live to be married. The best of all would be if, as has eminently happened in the case of some distinguished contemporaries, the merit of the work, in the reader's estimation, form an excuse for the author's breach of promise. Without presuming to hope that this may prove the case, it is only further necessary to mention that his resolution, like that of Benedict, fell a sacrifice to temptation at least, if not to stratagem. It is now about six months since the author, through the medium of his respectable publishers, received a parcel of papers containing the outlines of this narrative, with a permission, or rather a request, couched in highly flattering terms, that they might be given to the public, with such alterations as should be found suitable. Begin footnote. As it may be necessary, in the present edition, 1829, to speak upon the square, the author thinks it proper to own that the communication alluded to is entirely imaginary. End footnote. These were, of course, so numerous that, besides the suppression of names and of incidents approaching too much to reality, the work may in a great measure be said to be new written. Several anachronisms have probably crept in during the course of these changes, and the mottoes for the chapters have been selected without any reference to the supposed date of the incidents. For these, of course, the editor is responsible. Some others occurred in the original materials, but they are of little consequence. In point of minute accuracy, it may be stated that the bridge over the fourth, or rather the Avon Dew, or Black River, near the hamlet of Aberfoyle, had not an existence thirty years ago. It does not, however, become the editor to be the first to point out these errors, and he takes his public opportunity to thank the unknown and nameless correspondent, to whom the reader will owe the principal share of any amusement which he may derive from the following pages. 1st of December, 1871 Introduction 1829. When the author projected this further encroachment on the patience of an indulgent public, he was at some loss for a title, a good name being very nearly of as much consequence in literature as in life. The title of Rob Roy was suggested by the late Mr. Constable, whose sagacity and experience foresaw the germ of popularity which it included. No introduction can be more appropriate to the work than some account of the singular character whose name is given to the title page, and who, through good report and bad report, has maintained a wonderful degree of importance in popular recollection. This cannot be ascribed to the distinction of his birth, which, though that of a gentleman, had in it nothing of high destination, and gave him little right to command in his clan. Neither, though he lived a busy, restless and enterprising life, were his feats equal to those of other freebooters, who have been less distinguished. He owed his fame in great measure to his residing on the very verge of the highlands, and playing such pranks in the beginning of the eighteenth century as are usually ascribed to Robin Hood in the Middle Ages, and that, within forty miles of Glasgow, a great commercial city, the seat of a learned university. Thus a character like his blending the wild virtues, the subtle policy, and unrestrained license of an American Indian, was flourishing in Scotland during the Augustan age of Queen Anne and George I. Addison, it is probable, or Pope, 
would have been considerably surprised if they had known that there existed in the same island with them a personage of Rob Roy's peculiar habits and profession. It is this strong contrast betwixt the civilized and cultivated mode of life on the one side of the Highland line, and the wild and lawless adventure which were habitually undertaken and achieved by one who dwelt on the opposite side of that ideal boundary, which creates the interest attracted to his name. Hence it is that even yet, far and near, through vale and hill, are faces that attest the same, and kindle like a fire new stirred at sound of Rob Roy's name. There were several advantages which Rob Roy enjoyed for sustaining to advantage the character which he assumed. The most prominent of these was his descent from, and connection with, the clan MacGregor, so famous for their misfortunes, and the indomitable spirit with which they maintained themselves as a clan, linked and banded together, in spite of the most severe laws, executed with unheard of rigour against those who bore this forbidden surname. The history was that of several other of the original Highland clans, who were suppressed by more powerful neighbours, and either extirpated or forced to secure themselves by renouncing their own family appellation, and assuming that of the conquerors. The peculiarity in the story of the MacGregors is their attaining, with such tenacity, their separate existence and union as a clan under circumstances of the utmost urgency. The history of the tribe is briefly as follows, but we must premise that the tale depends in some degree on tradition. Therefore, excepting when written documents are quoted, it must be considered as in some degree dubious. The sept of MacGregor claimed a descent from Gregor, or Gregorius, third son, it is said, of Alpin, king of Scots, who flourished about 787. Hence their original patronymic is MacAlpine, and they are usually termed the clan Alpine. An individual tribe of them retains the same name. They are accounted one of the most ancient clans in the Highlands, and it is certain they were a people of original Celtic descent, and occupied at one period very extensive possessions in Perthshire and Argyleshire, which they imprudently continued, by the Cora Glaive, that is, the right of the sword. Their neighbours, the Earl of Argyle and Breedleblane, in the meanwhile, managed to leave the lands occupied by the MacGregors, engrossed in those charters which they easily obtained from the Crown, and thus constituted a legal right in their own favour, without much regard to its justice. As opportunity occurred of annoying or extirpating their neighbours, they gradually extended their own domains, by usurping, under the pretext of such royal grants, those of their more uncivilised neighbours. A Sir Duncan Campbell of Lochow, known in the Highlands by the name of Donach Dunan Coreakid, that is, Black Duncan with the cowl, it being his pleasure to wear such a headgear, is said to have been peculiarly successful in those acts of spoliation upon the clan MacGregor. The devoted sept, ever finding themselves iniquitously driven from their possessions, defended themselves by force, and occasionally gained advantage, which they used cruelly enough. This conduct, though natural, considering the country and time, was studiously represented at the capital as arriving from an untamable and innate ferocity, which nothing, it was said, could remedy, save cutting off the tribe of MacGregor, root and branch. In an act of Privy Council at Stirling, 22nd September, 1563, in the reign of Queen Mary. Commission is granted to the most powerful nobles and chiefs of the clans to pursue the clan Gregor with fire and sword. A similar warrant in 1563 not only grants the like powers to Sir John Campbell of Glenochy, the descendant of Duncan with the cowl, but discharges the lieges to receive or assist any of the clan Gregor, or afford them, under any colour whatever, meat, drink, or clothes. An atrocity which the clan Gregor committed in 1589 by the murder of John Drummond of Drummond Ernoch, a forester of the royal forest of Glenarty, is elsewhere given, with all its horrid circumstances. 
the clan swore upon the severed head of the murdered man, that they would make common cause in avowing the deed. This led to an act of the Privy Council, directing another crusade against the wicked clan Gregor, so long continuing in blood, slaughter, theft, and robbery, in which letters of fire and sword are denounced against them for the space of three years. The reader will find this particular fact illustrated in the introduction to the legend of Montrose, in the present edition of these novels. Other occasions frequently occurred, in which the MacGregors testified contempt for the laws, from which they had often experienced severity, but never protection. Though they were gradually deprived of their possessions, and of all ordinary means of procuring substance, they could not, nevertheless, be supposed likely to starve for famine, while they had the means of taking from strangers what they considered as rightfully their own. Hence they became versed in predatory forays and accustomed to bloodshed. Their passions were eager, and, with a little management on the part of some of their most powerful neighbours, they could easily be hounded out, to use an expressive Scottish phrase, to commit violence, of which the wily instigators took the advantage, and left the ignorant MacGregors an undivided portion of blame and punishment. This policy of pushing on the fierce clans of the highlands and borders to break the peace of the country is accounted by the historian one of the most dangerous practices of his own period, in which the MacGregors were considered as ready agents. Notwithstanding these severe denunciations, which were acted upon in the same spirit in which they were conceived, some of the clans still possessed property, and the chief of the name in 1592 is designed Alistair MacGregor of Glenstry. He is said to have been a brave and active man, but, from the tenor of his confession at his death, appears to be engaged in many and desperate feuds, one of which finally proved fatal to himself and many of his followers. This was the celebrated conflict at Glenfruin, near the southwestern extremity of Loch Lomond, in the vicinity of which the MacGregors continued to exercise much authority by the core glaive, or right of the strongest, which we have already mentioned. There had been a long and bloody feud betwixt the MacGregors and the Laird of Lusts. Head of the family of Cahoon, a powerful race in the lower part of Loch Lomond. The MacGregors' tradition affirms that the quarrel began on a very trifling subject. Two of the MacGregors being benighted, asked shelter in a house belonging to a dependent of the Cahoons, and were refused. They then retreated to an outhouse, took a wedder from the fold, killed it, and supped off the carcass, for which, it is said, they offered payment to the proprietor. The laird of Lus seized on the offenders, and, by the summary process which feudal barons had at their command, had them both condemned and executed. The MacGregors verify this account of the feud by appealing to a proverb current amongst them. Execrating the hour. Malt thur un gil. That the black wedder with the white tail was ever lambed. To avenge this quarrel, the laird of MacGregor assembled his clan to the number of three or four hundred men and marched towards Lass from the banks of Loch Long. By a pass called Raid Nagal, or the Highlandman's Pass. Sir Humphrey Cahoon received early notice of this incursion, and collected a strong force, more than twice the number of that of the invaders. He had with him the gentlemen of the name of Buchanan, with the Grahams, and other gentry of the Lennox, and a party of the citizens of Dumbarton, under command of Tobias Smollett, a magistrate or bailey of that town, an ancestor of the celebrated author. The parties met in the valley of Glen Frun, which signifies the Glen of Sorrow, a name that seemed to anticipate the event of the day, which, fatal to the conquered party, was at least equally so to the victors. The babe unborn of Clan Alpine, having reason to repent it, the MacGregors, somewhat discouraged by the appearance of a force much superior to their own, were cheered on to the attack by a seer, 
or second-sighted person, who professed that he saw the shrouds of the dead wrapped around their principal opponents. The clan charged with great fury on the front of the enemy, while John McGregor, with a strong party, made an unexpected attack on the flank. A great party of the Calhoun's force consisted in cavalry, which could not act in the boggy ground. They were said to have disputed the field manfully, but were at length completely routed, and a merciless slaughter was exercised on the fugitives, of whom betwixt two and three hundred fell on the field and in the pursuit. If the MacGregors lost, as is averred, only two men slain in the action, they had slight provocation for an indiscriminate massacre. It is said that their fury extended itself to a party of students for clerical orders, who had imprudently come to see the battle. Some doubt is thrown on this fact, from the indictment against the chief of the clan Gregor, being silent on the subject, as is the historian Johnston, and to Professor Ross, who wrote an account of the battle twenty-nine years after it was fought. It is, however, constantly averred, by the tradition of the country, and a stone where the deed was done is called, Lecher Minster, the Minster or Clerk's Flagstone. The MacGregors, by a tradition which is now found to be inaccurate, imputed this cruel action to the ferocity of a single man of their tribe, renowned for size and strength, called Dolgard, Kai War, or the great mouse-coloured man. He was MacGregor's foster brother, and the chief committed the youth to his charge, with directions to keep them safely till the affray was over. Whether fearful of their escape, or incensed by some sarcasms which they threw on his tribe, or whether, out of mere thirst of blood, this savage, while the other MacGregors were engaged in the pursuit, poignarded his helpless and defenceless prisoners, when the chieftain, on his return, demanded where the youths were, the care war drew out his bloody dirk, saying in Gaelic, Ask that, and God save me. The latter words alluded to the exclamation which his victims used when he was murdering them. It would seem, therefore, that this horrible part of the story is founded on fact, though the number of the youths so slain is probably exaggerated in the lowland accounts. The common people say that the blood of the Kale war victims can never be washed off the stone. When MacGregor learnt their fate, he expressed the utmost horror at the deed, and upbraided his foster brother with having done that which would occasion the destruction of him and his clan. This supposed homicide was the ancestor of Rob Roy, and the tribe from which he was descended. He lies buried at the church at Fortingal where his sepulchre, covered with a large stone, is still shown, and where his great strength and courage are the theme of many traditions. MacGregor's brother was one of the very few of the tribe who were slain. He was buried near the field of battle, and the place is marked by a rude stone, called the Grey Stone of MacGregor. Sir Humphrey Cahoon, being well mounted, escaped for a time to the castle of Banacor, or Benacar. It proved no sure defence, however, for he was shortly after murdered in the vault of the castle. The family annals say, by the MacGregors, though other accounts charge the deeds upon the MacFarlands. This battle of Glenfruin, and the severity which the victors exercised in the pursuit, was reported to King James the Sixth in a manner the most unfavourable to the clan Gregor, whose general character, being that of lawless though brave men, could not much avail them in such a case. That James might fully understand the extent of the slaughter, the widows of the slain, to the number of eleven score, in deep mourning, riding upon white palfreys, and each bearing her husband's bloody shirt on a spear, appeared at Stirling, in presence of a monarch, peculiarly accessible to such sights of fear and sorrow, to demand vengeance for the death of their husbands, upon those for whom they had been made desolate. The remedy resorted to was at least as severe as the cruelties which it was designed to punish. By an act of the Privy Council, dated 3rd April 1603, the name of MacGregor was expressly abolished, and those who had hitherto borne it were commanded to change it for other surnames 
the pain of death being denounced against those who should call themselves Gregor or MacGregor, the names of their fathers. Under the same penalty, all who had been at the conflict of Glenfruin, or accessory to other marauding parties charged in the act, were prohibited from carrying weapons, except a pointless knife to eat their victuals. By a subsequent act of council, 24th of June, 1613, death was announced against any persons of the tribe, formerly called MacGregor, who should presume to assemble in greater numbers than four. Again, by an act of Parliament, 1617, chapter 26, these laws were continued, and extended to the rising generation, in respect that great numbers of the children of those against whom the acts of Privy Council had been directed, were stated to be then approaching to maturity, who, if permitted to resume the name of their parents, would render the clan as strong as it was before. The execution of those severe acts was chiefly entrusted in the west to the Earl of Argyll and the powerful clan of Campbell, and to the Earl of Athol and his followers in the more eastern highlands of Perthshire. The MacGregors failed not to resist with the most determined courage, and many a valley in the west and north highlands retains memory of the severe conflicts, in which the proscribed clans sometimes obtained transient advantages, and always sold their lives dearly. At length the pride of Alistair MacGregor, the chief of the clan, was so much lowered by the sufferings of his people, that he resolved to surrender himself to the Earl of Argyll, with his principal followers, on condition that they should be sent out of Scotland. If the unfortunate chief's own account be true, he had more reasons than one for expecting some favour from the Earl, who had in secret advised and encouraged him to many of the desperate actions for which he was now called to so severe a reckoning. But Argyll, as old Birrell expresses himself, kept a Highlandman's promise with them, fulfilling it to the ear, and breaking it to the sense. MacGregor was sent under a strong guard to the frontier of England, and, being thus, in the literal sense, sent out of Scotland, Argyll was judged to have kept faith with him, though the same party which took him there brought him back to Edinburgh in custody. MacGregor of Glanstry was tried before the Court of Justiciary, 20th of January, 1604, and found guilty. He appears to have been instantly conveyed from the bar to the gallows, for Birrell, of the same date, reports that he was hanged at the cross, and, for distinction's sake, was suspended higher by his own height than two of his kindred and friends. On the 18th of February following, more men of the MacGregors were executed after a long imprisonment, and several others in the beginning of March. The Earl of Argyll's service, in conducting to the surrender of the insolent and wicked race in name of MacGregor, notorious common malefactors, and in the bringing in of MacGregor, with a great many of the leading men of the clan, worthily executed to death for their offences, is thankfully acknowledged by an Act of Parliament, 1607, Chapter 16, and rewarded with the grant of twenty childers of victual out of the lands of Kintyre. The MacGregors, notwithstanding the letters of fire and sword, and orders for military execution, repeatedly directed against them by the Scottish legislator, who apparently lost all the calmness of conscious dignity and security, and could not even name the outlawed clan, without vituperation, showed no inclination to be blotted out of the role of clanship. They submitted to the law, indeed, so far as to take the names of the neighbouring families amongst whom they happened to live, nominally becoming, as the case might render it most convenient, Drummonds, Campbells, Grahams, Buchanans, Stuarts, and the like. But to all intents and purposes of combination and mutual attachment, they remained their clan Gregor, united together for right or wrong, and menacing with the general vengeance of their race, all who committed aggressions against any individual of their number. They continued to take and give offence, with as little hesitation as before the legislative dispersion which had been attempted, as appears in the preamble to statute, 1633, chapter 30 settling forth that the clan Gregor, which had been suppressed and reduced to quietness by the great care of the late King James of eternal memory, had nevertheless broken out again, 
in the counties of Perth, Stirling, Clarkmanon, Monteith, Lennox, Angus, and Merrins, for which reason the statute re-establishes the disabilities attached to the clan, and grants a new commission for enforcing the laws against that wicked and rebellious race. Notwithstanding the extreme servitudes of King James I and Charles I against the unfortunate people, who were rendered furious by proscription, and then punished for yielding to the passions which had been willfully irritated, the MacGregors, to a man, attached themselves during the civil war to the cause of the latter monarch. Their bards have ascribed this to the native respect of the MacGregors for the crown of Scotland, which their ancestors once wore, and have appealed to their memorial bearings, which display a pine tree cross saltier wise, with a naked sword, the point of which supports a royal crown. But, without denying that such motives may have had their weight, we are disposed to think that a war which opened the low country to the raids of the clan Gregor would have more charms for them than any inducement to espouse the cause of the Covenanters, which would have brought them into contact with Highlanders as fierce as themselves, and having as little to lose. Patrick MacGregor, their leader, was the son of a distinguished chief, named Duncan Aberach, to whom Montrose wrote letters as to his trusty and special friend, expressing his reliance on his devoted loyalty, with an assurance that when once his majesty's affairs were placed upon a permanent footing, the grievances of the clan MacGregor should be readdressed. At a subsequent period of these melancholy times, we find the clan Gregor claiming the immunities of other tribes, when summoned by the Scottish Parliament to resist the invasion of the Commonwealth's army in 1651. On the last day of March in that year, a supplication to the King and Parliament, from Callum McCondachy, Vich Ewan, and Ewan McCondachy, Ewan in their own name, and that of the whole names of MacGregor, set forth that while, in obedience to the orders of Parliament, enjoining all clans to come out in the present service under their chieftains, for the defence of religion, king, and kingdoms, the petitioners were drawing their men to guard the passes at the head of the river Forth. Set forth, that while, in obedience to the orders of Parliament, enjoining all clans to come out in the present service under their chieftains, for the defence of religion, king, and kingdoms, the petitioners were drawing their men to guard the passes at the head of the river Forth. They were interfered with by the Earl of Athol, and the laird of Buchanan, who had required the attendance of many of the clan Gregor upon their arrays. This interference was doubtless owing to the change of name, which seems to have given rise to the claim of the Earl of Athol and the laird of Buchanan, to muster the MacGregors under their banners, as Murrays or Buchanans. It does not appear that the petition of the MacGregors, to be permitted to come out in a body, as other clans, received any answer. But upon the restoration, King Charles, in the first Scottish Parliament of his reign, Statute 1661, Chapter 195, annulled the various acts against the clan Gregor, and restored them to the full use of the family name, and the other privileges of liege subjects, setting forth as a reason for this lenity, that those who were formerly designed MacGregors had, during the late troubles, conducted themselves with such loyalty and affection to his majesty, as might justly wipe off all memory of further miscarriages, and take away all marks of reproach for the same. It is singular enough that it seems to have aggregated the feelings of the non-conforming Presbyterians, when the penalties which were most unjustly imposed upon themselves were relaxed towards the poor MacGregors. So little are the best men, any more than the worst, able to judge with impartiality of the same measures as apply to themselves or to others. Upon the restoration, an influence inimical to this unfortunate clan, said to be the same with that which afterwards dictated the massacre of Glencoe, occasioned the re-enaction of the penal statutes against the MacGregors. There are no reasons given why these highly penal acts should have been renewed, nor is it alleged that the clan had been guilty of late irregularities, Indeed, there is some reason to think that the cause was formed of set purpose, in a shape which elude observation. 
for, though continuing conclusions fatal to the rights of so many Scottish subjects, it is neither mentioned in the title nor in the rubric of the Act of Parliament in which it occurs, and is thrown briefly in it to the close of the statute, 1693, chapter 61, entitled An Act for the Justiciary in the Highlands. It does not, however, appear that after the revolution the acts against the clan were severely enforced, and in the latter half of the eighteenth century they were not enforced at all. Commissioners of supply were named in Parliament by the prescribed title of MacGregor, and decrees of courts of justice were pronounced, and legal deeds entered into under the same appellative. The MacGregors, however, while the laws continued in the statute book, still suffered under the deprivation of the name which was their birthright, and some attempts were made for the purpose of adopting another. McAlpine or Grant being proposed as the title of the whole clan in future. No agreement, however, could be entered into, and the evil was submitted to as a matter of necessity, and a full redress was obtained from the British Parliament, by an act abolishing for ever the penal statutes which had been so long imposed upon this ancient race. This statute, while merited by the services of many a gentleman of the clan in behalf of their king and country, was passed, and the clan proceeded to act upon it with the same spirit of ancient times, which had made them suffer severely, under a deprivation that would have been deemed of little consequence, by a great part of their fellow subjects. They entered into a deed, recognising John Murray of Lanrick, Esquire, afterwards Sir John MacGregor, Baronet, representative of the family Glencarronach as lawfully descended from the ancient stock and blood of the lairds and lords of MacGregor, and therefore acknowledged him as their chief on all lawful occasions and causes whatsoever. The deed was subscribed by 826 persons of the name of MacGregor, capable of bearing arms. A great many of the clan during the last war formed themselves into what was called the Clan Alpine Regiment, raised in 1799, under the command of their chief, and his brother, Colonel MacGregor. Having briefly noticed the history of this clan, which presents a rare and interesting example of the indelible character of the patriarchal system, the author must now offer some notices of the individual who gives name to these volumes. In giving an account of a Highlander, his pedigree is first to be considered. That of Rob Roy was deduced from Kea Hoar, the great mouse-coloured man, who is accused by tradition of having slain the younger students at the Battle of Glenfruin. Without puzzling ourselves and our readers with the intricacies of Highland genealogy, it is enough to say that, after the death of Alistair MacGregor of Glanstry, the clan, discouraged by the unremitting persecution of their enemies, seems not to have had the means of placing themselves under the command of a single chief. According to their places of residence and immediate descent, the several families were led and directed by chieftains, which, in the Highland acceptation, signifies the head of a particular branch of a tribe, in opposition to chief, who is the leader and commander of the whole name. The family and descendants of Dugald Cairn War lived chiefly in the mountains between Loch Lomond and Loch Katrine, and occupied a good deal of property there, whether by sufferance, by the right of the sword, which it was never safe to dispute with them, or by the legal titles of various kinds, it would be useless to inquire and unnecessary to detail. Enough. There they certainly were, a people whom their most powerful neighbours were desirous to conciliate, their friendship and peace being very necessary, to the quiet of the vicinage, and their assistance in war equally prompt and effectual. Rob Roy MacGregor Campbell whose last name he bore in consequence of the Acts of Parliament abolishing his own, was the younger son of Donald MacGregor of Glengyle, said to have been a lieutenant-colonel, probably in the service of James the Second. By his wife, a daughter of Campbell of Glenfalloch, Rob's own designation was of Inversened, but he appears to have acquired a right of some kind or other to the property or possession of Craig Royston, a domain of rock and forest lying on the east side of Loch Lomond, where the beautiful lake stretches into the dusky mountains of Glen Falloch. 
The time of his birth is uncertain, but he is said to have been active in the scenes of war and plunder which succeeded the revolution, and tradition affirms him to have been the leader in a predatory incursion into the parish of Kippen in the Lennox, which took place in the year 1691. It was of almost a bloodless character, only one person losing his life. But from the extent of the depredation, it was long distinguished by the name of Hairship, or Devastation, of Kippen. The time of his death is also uncertain, but he is said to have survived the year 1733, and died an aged man. It is probable he may have been twenty-five, about the time of the Hairship of Kippen, which would assign his birth to be the middle of the seventeenth century. In the more quiet times which succeed the Revolution, Rob Roy, or Red Robert, seems to have exerted his active talents, which were of no mean order, as a drover or trader in cattle, to a great extent. It may well be supposed that in those days no lowland, much less English drovers, ventured to enter the highlands. The cattle, which were the stable commodity of the mountains, were escorted down to fairs, on the borders of the lowlands, by a party of highlanders, with their arms rattling around them, and who dealt, however, in all honour and good faith with their southern customers. A fray, indeed, would sometimes arise when the lowland men, chiefly borderers, who had to supply the English market, used to dip their bonnets in the next brook, and wrapping them round their hands, oppose their cudgels to the naked broadswords, which had not always a superiority. I have heard from aged persons, who had been engaged in such a phrase, that the Highlanders used remarkably fair play, never using the point of the sword, far less their pistols or daggers, so that, with many a stiff thwack and many a bang, hard crabtree and cold iron rang. A slash or two or a broken head was easily accommodated, and as the trade was a benefit to both parties, trifling skirmishes were not allowed to interrupt its harmony. Indeed, it was of vital interest to the Highlanders, whose income, so far as derived from their estates, depended entirely on the sale of black cattle. And a sagacious and experienced dealer benefited not only himself, but his friends and neighbours by his speculations. Those of Rob Roy were, for several years, so successful as to inspire general confidence, and raise him in the estimation of the country in which he resided. His importance was increased by the death of his father, in consequence of which he succeeded to the management of his nephew, Gregor MacGregor, of Glengyle's property, and, as his tutor, to such influence with the clan and following as was due to the representative of Dugald Kerr. Such influence was the more uncontrolled, that this family of the MacGregors seemed to have refused adherence to MacGregor of Glencarnock the ancestor of the present Sir Ewan MacGregor, and asserted a kind of independence. It was at this time that Rob Roy acquired an interest by purchase, wadset or otherwise, to the property of Craig Royston, already mentioned. He was in particular favour, during this prosperous period of his life, with his nearest and most powerful neighbour, James, first Duke of Montrose, from whom he received many marks of regard. His grace consented to give his nephew and himself a right of property on the estates of Glengyle and Inversned, which they had till then only held as kindly tenants. The duke also, with a view to the interest of the country and his own estate, supported our adventurer by loans of money to a considerable amount, to enable him to carry on his speculations in the cattle trade. Unfortunately that species of commerce was and is liable to sudden fluctuations and Rob Roy was, by a sudden depression of markets, and, as a friendly tradition adds, by the bad faith of a partner named MacDonald, whom he had imprudently received into his confidence, and entrusted with a considerable sum of money, rendered totally insolvent. He absconded, of course. Not empty-handed, if it be true, as stated in an advertisement for his apprehension, that he had in his possession sums to the amount of a thousand pounds sterling, obtained from several noblemen and gentlemen under pretense of purchasing cows from them in the highlands. The advertisement appeared in June 1712, and was several times repeated. 
It fixes the period when Rob Roy exchanged his commercial adventures for speculations of a very different complexion. Footnote. See Appendix No. 1. Close footnote. He appears at this period first to have removed from his ordinary dwelling at Inversnaid ten or twelve Scots miles, which has doubled the number of English, farther into the highlands, and commenced the lawless sort of life which he afterwards followed. The Duke of Montrose, who conceived himself deceived and cheated by MacGregor's conduct, employs legal means to recover the money lent to him. Rob Roy's landed property was attached by the regular form of legal procedure, and his stock and furniture made the subject of arrest and sale. It is said that this diligence of the law, as it is called in Scotland, which the English more bluntly term distress, was used in this case with uncommon severity, and that the legal satellites, not usually the gentlest persons in the world, had insulted MacGregor's wife in a manner which would have aroused a milder man than he to thoughts of unbounded vengeance. She was a woman of fierce and haughty temper, and it is not unlikely to have disturbed the officers in the execution of their duty, and thus to have incurred ill-treatment, though, for the sake of humanity, it is to be hoped that the story sometimes told is a popular exaggeration. It is certain that she felt extreme anguish at being expelled from the banks of Loch Lomond, and gave vent to her feelings in a fine piece of pipe music, still well known to amateurs by the name of Rob Roy's Lament. The fugitive is thought to have found his first place of refuge in Glendochat, under the Earl of Breadalbane's protection, for, though that family had been active agents in the destruction of the MacGregors in former times, they had of late years sheltered a great many of the name in their old possessions. The Duke of Argyll was also one of Rob Roy's protectors, so far as to afford him, according to the Highland phrase, wood and water. The shelter, namely, that is afforded by the forests and lakes of an inaccessible country. The great men of the Highlands in that time, besides being anxiously ambitious to keep out what was called their following, or military retainers, also desirous to have at their disposal men of resolute character, to whom the world and the world's law were no friends, and who might at times ravish the lands or destroy the tenants of a feudal enemy, without bringing responsibility on their patrons. The strife between the names of Campbell and Graham during the civil wars of the seventeenth century had been stamped with mutual loss and inveterate enmity. The death of the great Marquess of Montrose on one side, the defeat at Inverlochy, and the cruel plundering of Lorne on the other, were reciprocal injuries not likely to be forgotten. Rob Roy was, therefore, sure of refuge in the country of the Campbells, both as having assumed their name, as connected by his mother with the family of Glen Fallock, and as an enemy to the rival house of Montrose. The extent of Argyll's possessions, and the power of retreating thither in any emergency, gave great encouragement to the bold schemes of revenge which he had adopted. This was nothing short of the maintenance of a predatory war against the Duke of Montrose, whom he considered as the author of his exclusion from civil society, and of the outlawry to which he had been sentenced, by letters of horning and caption, legal writ so called, as well as a seizure of his goods, and adjudication of his landed property. Against his grace, therefore, his tenants, friends, allies, and relatives, he disposed himself to employ every means of annoyance in his power. And though this was a circle sufficiently extensive for active depredation, Rob, who professed himself a Jacobite, took the liberty of extending his sphere of operations against all whom he chose to consider as friendly to the revolutionary government, or to that most obnoxious of measures, the union of the kingdoms. Under one or other of these pretexts, all his neighbours of the lowlands, who had anything to lose, or were unwilling to compound for security by paying him an annual sum for protection or forbearance, were exposed to his ravages. The country in which this private warfare, or system of depredation, was to be carried on, was, until opened up by roads, in the highest degree favourable for his purpose. It was broken up into narrow valleys, the habitable part of which bore no proportion to the huge wilderness of forest, rocks, and precipices 
by which they were encircled, and which was, moreover, full of inextricable passes, morasses, and natural strengths, unknown to any but the inhabitants themselves, where a few men acquainted with the ground were capable, with ordinary address, of baffling the pursuit of numbers. The opinions and habits of the nearest neighbours to the Highland line were also highly favourable to Rob Roy's purpose. A large proportion of them were of his own clan of MacGregor, who claimed the property of Balhuida and other Highland districts, as having been part of the ancient possessions of their tribe, though the harsh laws, under the severity of which they had suffered so deeply, had assigned the ownership to other families. The civil wars of the seventeenth century had accustomed these men to the use of arms, and they were peculiarly brave and fierce for remembrance of their sufferings. The vicinity of a comparatively rich lowland district gave also great temptations to incursion. Many belonging to other clans habituated to contempt of industry and to the use of arms drew towards an unprotected frontier which promised facility of plunder and the state of the country, now so peaceable and quiet, verified at that time the opinion which Dr. Johnson heard with doubt and suspicion. The most disorderly and lawless districts of the Highlands were those which lay nearest to the lowland line. There was, therefore, no difficulty in Rob Roy, descended of a tribe which was widely dispersed in the country you have described, collecting any number of followers whom he might be able to keep in action, and to maintain by his proposed operations. He himself appears to have been singularly adapted for the profession which he proposed to exercise. His stature was not of the tallest, but his person was uncommonly strong and compact. The great peculiarities of his frame were the breadth of his shoulders, and the great and almost disproportionate length of his arms, so remarkable indeed, that it was said that he could, without stooping, tie the garters of his highland hose, which are placed two inches below the knee. His countenance was open, manly, stern at periods of danger, but frank and cheerful in his hours of festivity. His hair was dark red, thick and frizzled, and curled short around the face. His fashion of dress showed, of course, the knees and upper part of the leg, which was described to me as resembling that of a highland bull, hirsute, with red hair and invincing muscular strength similar to that animal. To these personal qualifications must be added a masterly use of the highland sword, in which his length of arm gave him great advantage, and a perfect and intimate knowledge of all the recesses of the wild country in which he harboured, and the character of the various individuals, whether friendly or hostile, with whom he might come in contact. His mental qualities seemed to have been no less adapted to the circumstances in which he was placed. Though the descendant of the bloodthirsty Kerr Hoare, he inherited none of his ancestors' ferocity. On the contrary, Rob Roy avoided every appearance of cruelty, and it was not averred that he was ever the means of unnecessary bloodshed, or the actor in any deed which could lead the way to it. His schemes of plunder were contrived and executed with equal boldness and sagacity, and were almost universally successful, from the skill with which they were laid, and the secrecy and rapidity with which they were executed. Like Robin Hood of England, he was a kind and gentle robber, and while he took from the rich, was liberal in relieving the poor. This might in part be policy, but the universal tradition from the country speaks it to have arisen from a better motive. All whom I have conversed with, and I have in my youth seen some who knew Rob Roy personally, gave him the character of a benevolent and humane man, in his way. His ideas of morality were those of an Arab chief, being such as naturally arose out of his wild education. Supposing Rob Roy to have argued on the tendency of the life which he pursued, whether from choice or from necessity, he would doubtless have assumed to himself the character of a brave man, who, deprived of his natural rights by the partiality of laws, endeavoured to assert them by a strong hand of natural power. And he is most feliciously described as reasoning thus, in the high-toned poetry of my gifted friend Wordsworth. 
Say, then, that he was wise as brave, as wise in thought as bold in deed, for in the principle of things he sought his moral creed. Said generous Rob, what need of books? Burn all the statutes and their shelves. They stir us up against our kind, and worst against ourselves. We have a passion, make a law, too false to guide us or control, and for the law itself we fight in bitterness of soul. And puzzled, blinded, then we lose distinctions that are plain and few. These find I graven on my heart that tells me what to do. The creatures see a flood and field, and those that travel on the wind, with them no strife can last, they live in peace and peace of mind. For why? Because the good old rule sufficeth them, the simple plan, that they should take who have the power, and they should keep who can. A lesson which is quickly learned, a signal through which all can see, thus nothing here provokes the strong to wanton cruelty. And freakishness of mind is checked, he tamed who foolishly aspires, while to the measure of his might each fashions his desires. All kinds and creatures stand and fall, by strength of prowess or of wit. Tis God's appointment who must sway, and who is to submit. Since then, said Robin, right is plain, and the longest life is but a day. To have my ends, maintain my rights, I'll take the shortest way. And thus among these rocks he lived, through summer's heat and winter's snow. The eagle he was lord above, and Rob was lord below. We are not, however, to suppose the character of this distinguished outlaw to be that of an actual hero, acting uniformly and consistently on such moral principles as the illustrious bard who, standing by his grave, has vindicated his fame. On the contrary, as is common with barbarous chiefs, Rob Roy appears to have mixed his professions of principle with a large alloy of craft and dissimulation, of which his conduct during the Civil War is sufficient proof. It is also said, and truly, that although his courtesy was one of the strongest characteristics, yet sometimes he assumed an arrogance of manner which was not easily endured by the high-spirited men to whom it was addressed and drew the daring outlaw into frequent disputes, from which he did not always come off with credit. From this it has been inferred that Rob Roy was more of a bully than a hero, or at least that he had, according to the common phrase, his fighting days. Some aged men who knew him well have described him also as better at attack to Lucy, or scuffle within doors, than in mortal combat. The tenor of his life may be quoted to repel this charge, while at the same time it must be allowed that the situation in which he was placed rendered him prudently adverse to maintaining quarrels, where nothing was to be had save blows, and where success would have raised up against him new and powerful enemies, in a country where revenge was still considered as a duty rather than a crime. The power of commanding his passions on such occasions far from being inconsistent with the part which MacGregor had to perform, was essentially necessary, at the period when he lived, to prevent his career from being cut short. I may here mention one or two occasions on which Rob Roy appears to have given way in the manner alluded to. My late venerable friend, John Ramsay of Octertire, alike eminent as a classic scholar, and as an authentic register of the ancient history and manners of Scotland, informed me that on occasion of a public meeting at a bonfire in the town of Doan, Rob Roy gave some offence to James Edmundstone of Newton, the same gentleman who was unfortunately concerned in the slaughter of Lord Rollo, see MacLaurin's Criminal Trials No. 9, when Edmundstone compelled MacGregor to quit the town on pain of being thrown by him into the bonfire. I broke one off your ribs on a former occasion, said he, and now, Rob, if you provoke me further, I'll break your neck but it must be remembered that Edmundstone was a man of consequence in the Jacobite party, as he carried the royal standard of James the Seventh at the Battle of Sheriffmuir, and also that he was near the door of his own mansion-house, and probably surrounded by his friends and adherents. 
Rob Roy, however, suffered in reputation for retiring under such a threat. Another well-vouched case is that of Cunningham of Bokken. Henry Cunningham, Esquire, of Bokken, was a gentleman of Stirlingshire, who, like many exquisites of our own time, united a natural high spirit and daring character with an affectation of delicacy of address and manners amounting to foppery. A note, his courage and affectation of foppery were united, which is less frequently the case, with a spirit of innate modesty. He is thus described in Lord Binning's satirical verses entitled Argyle's Levy. The Duke then, turning round well pleased, said, Sure you've been in France. A more polite and jaunty man I never saw before. Then Harry bowed and blushed and bowed and strutted to the door. See a collection of original poems by Scotch Gentleman, volume 2, page 125. He chanced to be in company with Rob Roy, who, either in contempt of Boken's supposed effeminacy, or because he thought him a safe person to fix a quarrel on, a point which Rob's enemies alleged he was wont to consider, insulted him so grossly that a challenge passed between them. The good wife of the clocken had hidden Cunningham's sword, and while he rummaged the house in quest of his owner some other, Rob Roy went to the Shealing Hill, the appointed place of combat, and paraded there with great majesty, waiting for his antagonist. In the meantime, Cunningham had managed to rummage out an old sword, and, entering the ground of contest in all haste, rushed on the outlaw with such unexpected fury that he fairly drove him off the field. Nor did he show himself in the village again for some time. Mr. MacGregor Stirling has a softened account of this anecdote in his new edition of Nimmo's Stirlingshire. Still, he records Rob Roy's discomfiture. Occasionally Rob Roy suffered disasters and incurred great personal danger. On one remarkable occasion he was saved by the coolness of his lieutenant, Macanalster of Fletcher, the little John of his band, a fine active fellow, of course, and celebrated as a marksman. It happened that MacGregor and his party had been surprised and dispersed by a superior force of horse and foot, and the word was given to split and squander. Each shifted for himself, but a bold dragoon attached himself to pursuit of Rob, and overtaking him, struck at him with his broadsword. A plate of iron in his bonnet saved the MacGregor from being cut down to the teeth, but the blow was heavy enough to bear him to the ground, crying as he fell, Oh, Macalister, is there naething in her? I in the gun. The trooper at the same time exclaiming, Damn ye, your mother never wrought your nightcap, had his arm raised for a second blow, when Macalister fired, and the ball pierced the dragoon's heart. Such as he was, Rob Roy's progress in his occupation is thus described by a gentleman of sense and talent, who resided within the circle of his predatory wars, and probably felt their effects, and speaks of them, as might be expected with little of the forbearance with which, from their peculiar and romantic character, they are now regarded. This man, Rob Roy MacGregor, was a person of sagacity, and neither wanted stratagem nor address, and having abandoned himself to all licentiousness, set himself at the head of all the loose, vagrant, and desperate people of that clan, in the west end of Perth and Stirlingshire's, and infested those whole countries with thefts, robberies, and depredations, very few who lived within his reach, that is, within the distance of a nocturnal expedition, could promise to themselves security, either for their persons or effects, without subjecting themselves to pay him a heavy and shameful tax of blackmail. He at last proceeded to such a degree of audaciousness that he committed robberies, raised contributions, and resented quarrels, at the head of a very considerable body of armed men, in open day, and in the face of the government from Mr. Graham of Gartmore's Causes of the Disturbances in the Highlands. See Jameson's edition of Burt's Letters from the North of Scotland Appendix, Volume 2, page 348. The extent and success of these depredations cannot be surprising when we consider that the scene of them was laid in a country where the general law was neither enforced nor respected. Having recorded that the general habit of cattle-stealing had blinded even those of the better classes to the infamy of the practice, and that as men's property consisted entirely in herds, it was rendered in the highest degree precarious, Mr. Graham adds. On those accounts there is no culture of ground, no improvement of pastures, and from the same reasons no manufactures, no trade, in short, no industry. 
The people are extremely prolific, and therefore so numerous that there is not business in that country, according to its present order and economy, for the one half of them. Every place is full of idle people, accustomed to arms, and lazy in everything but rapines and depredations. As buddle or akavitai houses are to be found everywhere throughout the country, so in these they saunter away their time, and frequently consume there the returns of their illegal purchases. Here the laws have never been executed, nor the authority of the magistrate ever established. Here the officer of the law neither dare nor can execute his duty, and several places are about thirty miles from lawful persons. In short, there is no order, no authority, no government. The period of the rebellion, 1715, approached soon after Rob Roy had attained celebrity. His Jacobite partialities were now placed in opposition to his sense of the obligations which he owed to the indirect protection of the Duke of Argyll. But the desire of drowning his sounding steps amid the din of general war induced him to join the forces of the Earl of Mar, although his patron the Duke of Argyll was at the head of the army opposed to the Highland insurgents. The MacGregors, a large sept of them at least, that of Sien Mor, on this occasion were not commanded by Rob Roy, but by his nephew, already mentioned, Gregor MacGregor, otherwise called James Graham of Glengyle, and still better remembered by a Gaelic epithet, Glen Du, i.e. Black Knee, from a black spot on one of his knees, which his highland garb rendered visible. There can be no question, however, that being then very young, Glengyle must have acted on most occasions by the advice and direction of so experienced a leader as his uncle. The MacGregors assembled in numbers at that period, and began even to threaten the lowlands toward the lower extremity of Loch Lomond. They suddenly seized all the boats which were upon the lake, and, probably with a view to some enterprise of their own, drew them overland to Inversnaid in order to intercept the progress of a large body of West Country Whigs, who were in arms for the government, and moving in that direction. The Whigs made a, an excursion for the recovery of the boats. Their forces consisted of volunteers from Paisley, Kilpatrick, and elsewhere, who, with the assistance of a body of seamen, were towed up the river Leven in longboats, belonging to the ships of war then lying in the Clyde. At Luss they were joined by the forces of Sir Humphrey Colloquin, and James Grant, his son-in-law, with their followers, attired in the highland dress of the period which is picturesquely described. At night they arrived at Luss, where they were joined by Sir Humphrey Colloquin of Luss and James Grant of Placander, his son-in-law, followed by forty or fifty stately fellows in their short hose and belted plaids, armed each of them with a well-fixed gun on his shoulder, a strong, handsome target with a sharp-pointed steel of above half an L in length, screwed into the navel of it on his left arm, a sturdy claymore by his side, and a pistol or two with a dirk and knife in his belt. That description from Ray's History of the Rebellion, page 287. The whole party crossed to Craig Royston, but the MacGregors did not offer combat. If we are to believe the account of the expedition given by the historian Ray, they leaped on shore at Craig Royston with the utmost intrepidity, no enemy appearing to oppose them, and by the noise of their drums, which they beat incessantly, and the discharge of their artillery and small arms, terrified the MacGregors, whom they appear never to have seen, out of their fastnesses, and caused them to fly in a panic to the general camp of the Highlanders at Strathfillan. The low countrymen succeeded in getting possession of the boats at a great expenditure of noise and courage, and little risk of danger. After this temporary removal from his old haunts, Rob Roy was sent by the Earl of Mar to Aberdeen, to raise, it's believed, a part of the clan MacGregor, which is settled in that country. These men were of his own family, the race of Sir Mar. They were the descendants of about three hundred MacGregors, whom the Earl of Murray, about the year 1624, transported from his estates in Menteith to oppose against his enemies, the Mackintoshes, a race as hardy and restless as they were themselves. Ah, but while in the city of Aberdeen, Rob Roy met a relation of a very different class and character from those he was sent to summon to arms. This was Dr. James Gregory, by descent a MacGregor the patriarch of a dynasty of professors distinguished for literature and scientific talent, 
and the grandfather of the late eminent physician and accomplished scholar, Professor Gregory of Edinburgh. This gentleman was at the time Professor of Medicine in King's College, Aberdeen, and son of Dr. James Gregory, distinguished in science as the inventor of the reflecting telescope. With such a family, it may seem, our friend Rob could have had little communion, but civil war is a species of misery which introduces men to strange bedfellows. Dr. Gregory thought it a point of prudence to claim kindred, at so critical a period, with a man so formidable and influential. He invited Rob Roy to his house, and treated him with so much kindness, that he produced in his generous bosom a degree of gratitude which seemed likely to occasion very inconvenient effects. The professor had a son about eight or nine years old, a lively, stout boy of his age, with whose appearance our highland Robin Hood was much taken. On the day before his departure from the house of his learned relative Rob Roy, who had pondered deeply how he might requite his cousin's kindness, took Dr. Gregory aside and addressed him to this purport. My dear kinsman, I have been thinking what I could do to show me sense of your hospitality. Now here you have a fine-spirited boy of a son whom you are ruining by cramming him with your useless book-learning, and I am determined by way of manifesting my great good will to you and yours to take him with me and make a man of him. The learned professor was utterly overwhelmed when his warlike kinsman announced his kind purpose, in language which implied no doubt of its being a proposal which would he and ought to be accepted with the utmost gratitude. The task of apology or explanation was of a most delicate description, and there might have been considerable danger in suffering Rob Roy to perceive that the promotion with which he threatened the son was, in the father's eyes, the ready road to the gallows. Indeed, every excuse which he could at first think of, such as regret for putting his friend to trouble with a youth who had been educated in the lowlands and so on, only strengthened the chieftain's inclination to patronize his young kinsman, as he supposed they arose entirely from the modesty of the father. He would for a long time take no apology, and even spoke of carrying off the youth by a certain degree of kindly violence, whether his father consented or not. At length the perplexed professor pleaded that his son was very young, and in an infirm state of health, and not yet able to endure the hardships of a mountain life but that in another year or two he hoped his health would be firmly established, and he would be in a fitting condition to attend on his brave kinsman, and follow out the splendid destinies to which he opened the way. This agreement being made, the cousins parted, Rob Roy pledging his honour to carry his young relation to the hills with him on his next return to Aberdeenshire, and Dr. Gregory, doubtless, praying in his secret soul that he might never see Rob's highland face again. James Gregory, who thus escaped being his kinsman's recruit, and in all probability his henchman, was afterwards professor of medicine in the college, and, like most of his family, distinguished by his scientific acquirements. He was rather of an irritable and pertinacious disposition, and his friends were wont to remark, when he showed any symptom of these foibles, "'Ha! Huh, this comes from not having been educated by Rob Roy.' The connection between Rob Roy and his classical kinsman did not end with the period of Rob's transient power. At a period considerably subsequent to the year 1715, he was walking in the castle street of Aberdeen, arm in arm with his host, Dr. James Gregory, when the drums in the barracks suddenly beat to arms, and soldiers were seen issuing from the barracks. "'If these lads are turning out,' said Rob, taking leave of his cousin with great composure, "'it's time for me to look after me safety.' So saying, he dived down a close, and, as John Bunyan said, went upon his way, and was seen no more. No. The first of these anecdotes, which brings the highest pitch of civilization so closely in contact with the half-savage state of society, I have heard told by the late distinguished Dr. Gregory, and the members of his family have had the kindness to collate the story with their recollections and family documents, and furnish the authentic particulars. The second rests on the recollection of an old man, who was present when Rob took French leave of his literary cousin, on hearing the drums beat, and communicated the circumstance to Mr. Alexander Forbes, a connection of Dr. Gregory by marriage, who is still alive. We have already stated that Rob Roy's conduct during the insurrection of 1715 was very equivocal. His person and followers were in the Highland army, but his heart seems to have been with the Duke of Argyle's. 
yet the insurgents were constrained to trust to him as their only guide when they marched from Perth toward Dunblane, with the view of crossing the Forth at what are called the Fords of Flew, and when they themselves said he could not be relied upon. This movement to the westward on the part of the insurgents brought on the Battle of Sheriff Muir, indecisive indeed in its immediate results, but of which the Duke of Argyle reaped the whole advantage. In this action it will be recollected that the right wing of the Highlanders broke and cut to pieces Argyle's left wing, while the clans on the left of Mar's army, though consisting of Stuarts, Mackenzies, and Camerons, were completely routed. During this medley of flight and pursuit, Rob Roy retained his station on a hill in the center of the Highland position and though it said his attack might have decided the day, he could not be prevailed upon to charge. This was the more unfortunate for the insurgents, as the leading of a party of the Macphersons had been committed to MacGregor. This, it is said, was owing to the age and infirmity of the chief of that name, who, unable to lead his clan in person, objected to his heir apparent, Macpherson of Nord, discharging his duty on that occasion, so that the tribe, or a part of them, were brigaded with their allies, the MacGregors. While the favorable moment for action was gliding away unemployed, Mar's positive orders reached Rob Roy that he should presently attack, to which he coolly replied, Nah, nah, if they cannot do it without me, they cannot do it with me. One of the Macphersons, named Alexander, one of Rob's original profession, Videlicet, a drover, but a man of great strength and spirit, was so incensed at the inactivity of this temporary leader, that he threw off his plaid, drew his sword, and called out to his clansmen, Let us endure this no longer. Feel not, Legia, I will. Rob Roy replied with great coolness, Were the question about driving Highland Stots or Kylo's, Sandy, I'd yield to your superior skill, but as it respects the leading of men, I must be allowed to be the better judge. Did the matter respect driving Glen Eagle's Stouts? answered the Macpherson. The question with Rob would not be which was to be last, but which was to be foremost. Incensed at this sarcasm, MacGregor drew his sword, and they would have fought upon the spot if their friends on both sides had not interfered. But the moment of attack was completely lost. Rob did not, however, neglect his own private interest on the occasion. In the confusion of an undecided field of battle he enriched his followers by plundering the baggage and the dead on both sides. The fine old satirical ballad on the Battle of Sheriff Muir does not forget to stigmatize our hero's conduct on this memorable occasion. Rob Roy, he stood watch on a hill for to catch the booty for aught that I saw, man, for he ne'er advanced from the place where he stanced till Namir was to do there at our man. Notwithstanding the sort of neutrality which Rob Roy had continued to observe during the progress of the rebellion, he did not escape some of its penalties. He was included in the act of attainder, and the house in Brettlebane, which was his place of retreat, was burned by General Lord Cadogan, when, after the conclusion of the insurrection, he marched through the highlands to disarm and punish the offending clans. But upon going to Inverary with about forty or fifty of his followers, Rob obtained favor by an apparent surrender of their arms to Colonel Patrick Campbell of Finna, who furnished them and their leader with protections under his hand. Being thus in a great measure secured from the resentment of government, Rob Roy established his residence at Craig Royston, near Loch Lomond, in the midst of his own kinsmen, and lost no time in resuming his private quarrel with the Duke of Montrose. For this purpose he soon got on foot as many men, and well armed, too, as he had yet commanded. He never stirred without a bodyguard of ten or twelve picked followers, and without much effort could increase them to fifty or sixty. The Duke was not wanting in efforts to destroy this troublesome adversary. His grace applied to General Carpenter commanding the forces in Scotland, and by his orders three parties of soldiers were directed from the three different points of Glasgow, Stirling, and Finlarig, near Killin. Mr. Graham of Killan, the Duke of Montrose's relation and factor, sheriff depute also of Dumbartonshire, accompanied the troops that they might act upon the civil authority and have the assistance of a trusty guide well acquainted with the hills. It was the object of these several columns to arrive about the same time in the neighborhood of Rob Roy's residence, and surprise him and his followers. But heavy rains, the difficulties of the country, and the good intelligence which the outlaw was always supplied with, disappointed their well-concerted combination. The troops, finding the birds were flown, avenged themselves by destroying the nest. They burned Rob Roy's house, 
though not with impunity, for the MacGregors concealed among the thickets and cliffs fired on them and killed a grenadier. Rob Roy avenged himself for the loss which he sustained on this occasion by an act of singular audacity. About the middle of November, 1716, John Graham of Killearn, already mentioned as factor of the Montrose family, went to a place called Chapel Eric, where the tenants of the Duke were summoned to appear with their termly rents. They appeared accordingly, and the factor had received ready money to the amount of about three hundred pounds, when Rob Roy entered the room at the head of an armed party. The steward endeavoured to protect the Duke's property by throwing the books of accounts and money into a garret, thrusting they might escape notice, but the experienced freebooter was not to be baffled where such a prize was at stake. He recovered the books and the cash, placed himself calmly in the receipt of custom, examined the accounts, pocketed the money, and gave receipts on the Duke's part, saying he would hold reckoning with the Duke of Montrose out of the damages which he had sustained by his grace's means, in which he included the losses he had suffered as well by the burning of his house by General Cadogan, as by the later expedition against Craig Royston. He then requested Mr. Graham to attend him, nor does it appear that he treated him with any personal violence or even rudeness, although he informed him he regarded him as a hostage, and menaced rough usage in case he should be pursued or in danger of being overtaken. Few more audacious feats have been performed. After some rapid changes of place, the fatigue attending which was the only annoyance that Mr. Graham seems to have complained of, he carried his prisoner to an island on Loch Catron, and caused him to write to the Duke to state that his ransom was fixed at thirty-four hundred merks, pounds, being the balance which MacGregor pretended remained due to him, after deducting all that he owed to the Duke of Montrose. However, after detaining Mr. Graham five or six days in custody on the island, which is still called Rob Roy's prison, and could be no comfortable dwelling for November nights, the outlaw seems to have despaired of attaining further advantage from his bold attempt, and suffered his prisoner to depart uninjured with the account books and bills granted by the tenants, taking special care to retain the cash. The reader will find two original letters of the Duke of Montrose with that which Mr. Graham of Killearn dispatched from his prison house by the outlaw's command in the appendix. Number two. About 1717 our chieftain had the dangerous adventure of falling into the hands of the Duke of Atoll almost as much his enemy as the Duke of Montrose himself, but his cunning and dexterity again freed him from certain death. See a contemporary account of this curious affair in the appendix number five. Other pranks are told of Rob, which argue the same boldness and sagacity as the seizure of Killearn. The Duke of Montrose, weary of his insolence, procured a quantity of arms, and distributed them among his tenantry, in order that they might defend themselves against future violences, but they fell into different hands from those they were intended for. The MacGregors made separate attacks on the houses of the tenants, and disarmed them all, one after another, not, as was supposed, without the consent of many of the persons so disarmed. As a great part of the Duke's rents were payable in kind, there were gurnels, granaries, established for storing up the corn at Moulin, and elsewhere on the Buchanan estate. To these storehouses Rob Roy used to repair with a sufficient force, and, of course, when he was least expected, and insist upon the delivery of quantities of grain, sometimes for his own use, and sometimes for the assistance of the country people, always giving regular receipts in his own name, and pretending to reckon with the Duke for what sums he received. In the meantime, a garrison was established by government, the ruins of which may still be seen about half-way betwixt Loch Lomond and Loch Catron, upon Rob Roy's original property of Inversnade. Even this military establishment could not bridle the restless MacGregor. He contrived to surprise the little fort, disarm the soldiers, and destroy the fortification. It was afterwards re-established, and again taken by the MacGregors under Rob Roy's nephew, Glyn Dhu, previous to the insurrection of 1745-6. Finally, the fort of Inversnade was a third time repaired, after the extinction of civil discord, and when we find the celebrated General Wolfe commanding in it, the imagination is strongly affected by the variety of time and events which the circumstance brings simultaneously to recollection. It is now totally dismantled. Oh, about 1792, when the author chanced to pass that way, 
while on a tour through the highlands, a garrison consisting of a single veteran was still maintaining at Inversnaid. The venerable warder was reaping his barley croft in all peace and tranquillity, and when we asked admittance to repose ourselves, he told us we would find the key to the fort under the door. It was not, strictly speaking, as a professed depredator that Rob Roy now conducted his operations, but as a sort of contractor for the police. In Scottish phrase, a lifter of black nail. The nature of this contract has been described in the novel of Waverley, and in the notes on that work. Mr. Graham of Gartmore's description of the character may be here transcribed. The confusion and disorders of the country were so great, and the government so absolutely neglected it, that the sober people were obliged to purchase some security to their effects by shameful and ignominious contracts of blackmail. A person who had the greatest correspondence with the thieves was agreed with to preserve the lands contracted for from thefts, for certain sums to be paid yearly. Upon this fund he employed one half of the thieves to recover stolen cattle, and the other half of them to steal in order to make this agreement and blackmail contract necessary. The estates of those gentlemen who refuse to contract, or give countenance to that pertinacious practice, are plundered by the thieving part of the watch, in order to force them to purchase their protection. Their leader calls himself the captain of the watch, and his banditti go by that name, and as this gives them a kind of authority to traverse the country, so it makes them capable of doing any mischief. These corps through the highlands make altogether a very considerable body of men, inured from their infancy to the greatest fatigues, and very capable to act in a military way when occasion offers. People who are ignorant and enthusiastic, who are in absolute dependence upon their chief or landlord, who are directed in their consciousness by Roman Catholic priests or non-juring clergymen, and who are not masters of any property, may easily be formed into any mould. They fear no dangers, as they have nothing to lose, and so can with ease be induced to attempt anything. Nothing can make their condition worse. Confusions and troubles do commonly indulge in such licentiousness, that by these they better it. That from Letters from the North of Scotland, Volume 2, pages 344-345. As the practice of contracting for blackmail was an obvious encouragement to rapine, and a great obstacle to the course of justice, it was by the statute of 1567, chapter 21, declared a capital crime, both on the part of him who levied and him who paid this sort of tax. But the necessity of the case prevented the execution of this severe law, I believe, in at least one instance, and men went on submitting to a certain unlawful imposition, rather than run the risk of utter ruin, just as it is now found difficult or impossible to prevent those who have lost a very large sum of money by robbery, from compounding with the felons for restoration of a part of their booty. At what rate Rob Roy levied blackmail I never heard stated, but there is a formal contract by which his nephew, in 1741, agreed with various landlords of estates in the counties of Perth, Stirling, and Dumbarton, to recover cattle stolen from them, or to pay the value within six months of the loss being intimated, if such intimation were made to him with sufficient dispatch, in consideration of a payment of five pounds on each one hundred pounds of valued rent, which was not a very heavy insurance. Petty thefts were not included in the contract, but the theft of one horse, or one head of black cattle, or of sheep exceeding the number of six, fell under the agreement. Rob Roy's profits upon such contracts brought him in a considerable revenue in money or cattle, of which he made a popular use, for he was publicly liberal as well as privately beneficent. The minister of the parish of Bulkhider, whose name was Robertson, was at one time threatening to pursue the parish for an augmentation of his stipend. Rob Roy took an opportunity to assure him that he would do well to abstain from this new exaction, a hint which the minister did not fail to understand. But to make him some indemnification, MacGregor presented him every year with a cow and a fat sheep, and no scruples as to the mode in which the donor came by them are said to have affected the reverend gentleman's conscience. The following amount of the proceedings of Rob Roy on an application to him from one of his contractors had in it something very interesting to me, 
as told by an old countryman in the Lennox who was, who was present on the expedition. But as there is no point or marked incident in the story, and as it must necessarily be without the half-frightened, half-bewildered look with which the narrator accompanied his recollections, it may possibly lose its effect when transferred to paper. My informant stated himself to have been a lad of fifteen, living with his father on the estate of a gentleman in the Lennox, whose name I have forgotten, in the capacity of herd. On a fine morning in the end of October, the period when such calamities were almost always to be apprehended, they found the highland thieves had been down upon them and swept away ten or twelve head of cattle. Rob Roy was sent for, and came with a party of seven or eight armed men. He heard with great gravity all that could be told him of the circumstances of the crack, and expressed his confidence that the herd widdyfows, or mad herdsmen, a name given to cattle stealers, properly one who deserves to fill a widdy or a halter. Anyway, the herd widdyfows could not have carried their booty far, and that he should be able to recover them. He desired that two lowlanders should be sent on the party, as it was not to be expected that any of his gentlemen would take the trouble of driving the cattle when he should recover possession of them. My informant and his father were dispatched on the expedition. They had no good will to the journey, nevertheless provided with a little food and with a dog to help them to manage the cattle. They set off with MacGregor. They travelled a long day's journey in the direction of the mountain Ben Vorlich, and slept for the night in a ruinous hut or bothy. The next morning they resumed their journey among the hills, Rob Roy directing their course by signs and marks on the heath which my informant did not understand. About noon Rob commanded the armed party to halt and to lie couched in the heather, where it was the thickest. "'Do you and your son,' he said to the oldest lowlander, "'go boldly over the hill you'll see beneath you, and a glen on the other side your master's cattle feeding. It may be with others.' Gather your own together, taking care to disturb no one else, and drive them to this place. If anyone speak to you or threaten you, tell them that I am here at the head of twenty men. But what if they abuse us or kill us? said the lowland peasant, by no means delighted at finding the embassy imposed on him and his son. If they do you any wrong, said Rob, I'll never forgive them as long as I live. The lowlander was by no means content with this security, but did not think it safe to dispute Rob's injunctions. He and his son climbed the hill, therefore, found a deep valley, where they grazed, as Rob had predicted, a large herd of cattle. They cautiously selected those which their master had lost, and took measures to drive them over the hill. As soon as they began to remove them, they were surprised by hearing cries and screams, and, looking around in fear and trembling, they saw a woman, seeming to have started out of the earth, who flighted at them, that is, scolded them in Gaelic. When they contrived, however, in the best Gaelic they could muster, to deliver the message Rob Roy told them, she became silent, and disappeared without offering them any further annoyance. The chief heard their story on their return, and spoke with great complacency of the art which he possessed of putting such things to right, without any unpleasant bustle. The party were now on their road home, and the danger, though not the fatigue, of the expedition was at an end. They drove on the cattle with little repose until it was nearly dark, when Rob proposed to halt for the night upon a wide moor, across which a cold northeast wind with frost on its wing was whistling to the tune of the pipers of Strathairn, oh, the winds which sweep a wild glen in Badenacher, so called. The highlanders, sheltered by their plaids, lay down on the heath quite comfortably enough, but the lowlanders had no protection whatever. Rob Roy, observing this, directed one of his followers to afford the old man a portion of his plaid. Brother Callant, the boy, he may, said the freebooter, keep himself warm by walking about and watching the cattle. My informant heard this sentence with no small distress, and as the frost wind grew more and more cutting, it seemed to freeze the very blood in his young veins. He'd been exposed to weather all his life, he said, but never could forget the cold of that night insomuch that in the bitterness of his heart he cursed the bright moon for giving no heat with so much light. At length the sense of cold and weariness became so intolerable that he resolved to desert his watch to seek some repose and shelter. With that purpose he couched himself down behind one of the most bulky of the Highlanders, who acted as lieutenant to the party. Not satisfied with having secured the shelter of the man's large person, 
he coveted a share of his plaid, and by imperceptible degrees drew a corner of it round him. He was now comparatively in paradise, and slept sound till daybreak, when he awoke, and was terribly afraid, on observing that his nocturnal operations had altogether uncovered the Duhenwassel's neck and shoulders, which, lacking the plaid which should have protected them, were covered with clanric, i.e. hoar-frost. The young lad rose in great dread of a beating, at least, when it should be found how luxuriously he had been accommodated at the expense of a principal person of the party. Good Mr. Lieutenant, however, got up and shook himself, rubbing off the hoar-frost with his plaid and muttering something of a cold nicht. They then drove on the cattle, which were restored to their owner without further adventure. The above can hardly be termed a tale, but yet it contains materials both for the poet and the artist. It was perhaps about the same time that by a rapid march into the Balkhidder hills at the head of a body of his own tenantry, the Duke of Montrose actually surprised Rob Roy and made him prisoner. He was mounted behind one of the Duke's followers named James Stuart, and made fast to him by a horse girth. The person who had him thus in charge was grandfather of the intelligent man of the same name, now deceased, who lately kept the inn in the vicinity of Loch Catherine, and acted as a guide to visitors through that beautiful scenery. From him I learned the story many years before. He was either a publican or a guide, except to more foul shooters. It was evening, to resume the story, and the Duke was pressing on to lodge his prisoner so long sought after in vain, in some place of security when in crossing the teeth or forth, I forget which, MacGregor took an opportunity to conjure Stuart, by all the ties of old acquaintance and good neighbourhood, to give him some chance of an escape from an assured doom. Stuart was moved with compassion, perhaps with fear. He slipped the girth-buckle, and Rob, dropping down from behind the horse's crop, dived, swam, and escaped, pretty much as described in the novel. When James Stuart came on shore, the Duke hastily demanded where his prisoner was, and as no distinct answer was returned, instantly suspected Stuart's connivance at the escape of the outlaw, and, drawing a steel pistol from his belt, struck him down with a blow on the head, from the effects of which his descendant said he never completely recovered. In the success of his repeated escapes from the pursuit of his powerful enemy, Rob Roy at length became a wanton and facetious. He wrote a mock challenge to the Duke, which he circulated among his friends, to amuse them over a bottle. The reader will find this document in the appendix. Appendix number three. It's written in a good hand, and not particularly deficient in grammar or spelling. Our southern readers must be given to understand that it was a piece of humor, a quiz, in short, on the part of the outlaw, who was too sagacious to propose such a rencontre in reality. This letter was written in the year 1719. In the following year Rob Roy composed another epistle very little to his own reputation, as he therein confesses having played booty during the Civil War of 1715. It is addressed to General Wade, at that time engaged in disarming the Highland clans, and making military roads through the country. The letter is a singular composition. It sets out the writer's real and unfeigned desire to have offered his service to King George, but for his liability to be thrown into jail for a civil debt at the instance of the Duke of Montrose. Being thus debarred from taking the right side, he acknowledged he embraced the wrong one upon Falstaff's principle, that since the king wanted men and the rebels soldiers, it were worse shame to be idle in such a stirring world than to embrace the worst side, where it as black as rebellion could make it. The impossibility of his being neutral in such a debate Rob seems to lay down as an undeniable proposition. At the same time, while he acknowledges having been forced into an unnatural rebellion against King George, he pleads that he not only avoided acting offensively against His Majesty's forces on all occasions, but, on the contrary, sent to them what intelligence he could collect from time to time, for the truth of which he refers to His Grace the Duke of Argyle. What influence this plea had on General Wade we have no means of knowing. Rob Roy appears to have continued to live very much as usual, his fame, in the meanwhile, passed beyond the narrow limits of the country in which he resided. A pretended history of him appeared in London during his lifetime, under the title of the Highland Rogue. It's a catchpenny publication, bearing in front the effigy of a species of ogre, with a beard of a foot in length. 
and his actions are as much exaggerated as his personal appearance. Some few of the best-known adventures of the hero are told, though with little accuracy, but the greater part of the pamphlet is entirely fictitious. It's a great pity so excellent a theme for a narrative of the kind had not fallen into the hands of Defoe, who was engaged at the time on subjects somewhat similar, though inferior in dignity and interest. As Rob Roy advanced in years, he became more peaceable in his habits, and his nephew, Chlun Du, with most of his tribe, renounced those peculiar quarrels with the Duke of Montrose, by which his uncle had been distinguished. The policy of that great family had latterly been rather to attach this wild tribe by kindness than to follow the mode of violence which had been hitherto ineffectually resorted to. Leases at a low rent were granted to many of the MacGregors, who had heretofore held possessions in the Duke's Highland property merely by occupancy, and Glengyle, or Black Knee, who continued to act as collector of blackmail, managed his police as a commander of the Highland Watch, arrayed at the charge of government. He is said to have strictly abstained from the open and lawless depredations which his kinsmen had practiced. It was probably after this state of temporary quiet had been obtained that Rob Roy began to think of the concerns of his future state. He had been bred and long professed himself a Protestant, but in his later years he embraced the Roman Catholic faith, perhaps on Mrs. Cole's principle, that it was a comfortable religion for one of his calling. He is said to have alleged, as the cause of his conversion, a desire to gratify the noble family of Perth, who were then strict Catholics. Having, as he observed, assumed the name of the Duke of Argyle, his first protector, he could pay no compliment worth the Earl of Perth's acceptance, save complying with his mode of religion. Rob did not pretend, when pressed closely on the subject, to justify all the tenets of Catholicism, and acknowledged that extreme unction always appeared to him a great waste of olzy, or oil. Such an admission is ascribed to the Robert Donald Bean Lean in Waverley. Chapter 22 In the last years of Rob Roy's life, his clan was involved in a dispute with one more powerful than themselves, Stuart of Appin. A chief of the tribe so named was proprietor of a hill farm in the braes of Balkider, called Invernenty. The MacGregors of Rob Roy's tribe claimed a right to it by ancient occupancy, and declared they would oppose to the uttermost the settlement of any person upon the farm not being of their own name. The Stuarts came down with two hundred men well armed to do themselves justice by main force. The MacGregors took to the field, but were unable to muster an equal strength. Rob Roy, fending himself the weaker party, asked a parley in which he represented that both clans were friends to the king, and that he was unwilling that they should be weakened by mutual conflict, and thus made a merit of surrendering to Appin the disputed territory of Invernendi. Appin accordingly settled his tenants there, at an easy quit-rent. The MacLarens, a family dependent on the Stuarts, and from whose character of strength and bravery it was expected that they would make their right good if annoyed by the MacGregors. When all this had been amicably adjusted, in the presence of the two clans drawn up in arms near the Kirk of Balkidder, Rob Roy, apparently fearing his tribe might be thought to have conceded too much upon the occasion, stepped forward and said that, where so many gallant men were met in arms, it would be shameful to part without a trial of skill, and therefore he took the freedom to invite any gentleman of the Stuarts present to exchange a few blows with him for the honor of their respective clans. The brother-in-law of Appin and second chieftain of the clan, Alistair Stuart of Invernile, accepted the challenge, and they encountered with broad sword and target before their respective kinsmen. Uh, some accounts state that Appin himself was Rob Roy's antagonist on this occasion. My recollection from the accounts of Invernhale himself was as stated in the text, but the period when I received the information is now so distant that it is possible I may be mistaken. Invernhale was rather of low stature, but very well made, athletic, and an excellent swordsman. The combat lasted till Rob received a slight wound in the arm, which was the usual termination of such a combat when fought for honor only, and not with a mortal purpose. Rob Roy dropped his point and congratulated his adversary, and having been the first man who ever drew blood from him. The victor generously acknowledged that, without the advantage of youth and the agility accompanying it, he probably could not have come off with advantage. 
This was probably one of Rob Roy's last exploits in arms. The time of his death is not known with certainty, but he is generally said to have survived 1738, and to have died an aged man. When he found himself approaching his final change, he expressed some contrition for particular parts of his life. His wife laughed at these scruples of conscience, and exhorted him to die like a man as he had lived. In reply he rebuked her for her violent passions, and the counsel she had given him. "'You have put strife,' he said, "'betwixt me and the best men of the country, and now you would place enmity between me and my God.' There is a tradition no way inconsistent with the former, if the character of Rob Roy be justly considered, that while on his deathbed he learned that a person with whom he was at enmity proposed to visit him. "'Raise me from my bed,' said the invalid. "'Throw me plaid round me, and bring me my claymore, a dirk, and pistols. It shall never be said that a foeman said Rob Roy MacGregor defenceless and unarmed.' His foeman, conjectured to be one of the MacLarens before and after mentioned, entered and paid his compliments, inquiring after the health of his formidable neighbour. Rob Roy maintained a cold, haughty civility during their short conference, and so soon as he had left the house. Now, he said, all is over, let the piper play. Ha, tell me, Tullich. We return no more. And he is said to have expired before the dirge was finished. This singular man died in bed in his own house in the parish of Balkidder, he was buried in the churchyard of the same parish, where his tombstone is only distinguished by a rude attempt at the figure of a broadsword. The character of Rob Roy is, of course, a mixed one. His sagacity, boldness, and prudence, qualities so highly necessary to success in war, became in some degree vices from the manner in which they were employed. The circumstances of his education, however, must be admitted as some extenuation of his habitual transgressions against the law and for his political tergiversations he might in that distracted period plead that example of men far more powerful and less excusable in becoming the sport of circumstances than the poor and desperate outlaw. On the other hand, he was in the constant exercise of virtues, the more meritorious as they seem inconsistent with his general character. Pursuing the occupation of a predatory chieftain, in modern phrase a captain of banditti, Rob Roy was moderate in his revenge, and humane in his successes. No charge of cruelty or bloodshed, unless in battle, is brought against his memory. In like manner, the formidable outlaw was the friend of the poor, and, to the utmost of his ability, the support of the widow and the orphan, kept his word when pledged, and died lamented in his own wild country, where there were hearts grateful for his beneficence, though their minds were not sufficiently instructed to appreciate his errors. The author perhaps ought to stop here, but the fate of a part of Rob Roy's family is so extraordinary as to call for a continuation of this somewhat prolix account, as affording an interesting chapter, not on highland manners alone, but on every stage of society in which the people of a primitive and half-civilized tribe are brought into close contact with a nation in which civilization and polity have attained a complete superiority. Rob had five sons, Col, Ronald, James, Duncan, and Robert. Nothing occurs worth notice concerning three of them, but James, who was a very handsome man, seemed to have had a good deal of his father's spirit, and the mantle of Douglas Yarmore had apparently descended on the shoulders of Robin Oig, that is, young Robin. Shortly after Rob Roy's death, the ill will which the MacGregors entertained against the MacLarens again broke out, at the instigation, it was said, of Rob's widow who seems thus far to have deserved the character given to her by her husband, as an ate, stirring up to blood and strife. Robin Oig, under her instigation, swore that as soon as he could get back a certain gun which had belonged to his father, and had been lately at dawn to be repaired, he would shoot MacLaren for having presumed to settle on his mother's land. This fatal piece was taken from Robin Oig when he was seized many years afterwards, it remains in possession of the magistrates before whom he was brought for examination, and now makes part of a small collection of arms belonging to the author. It was a Spanish barreled gun, marked with the letters R.M.C., for Robert MacGregor Campbell. He was as good as his word, and shot MacLaren when between the stilts of his plough, wounding him mortally. The aid of a highland leech was procured, who probed the wound with a probe made out of a castock, i.e., 
the stalk of a coal-wort or cabbage. This learned gentleman declared he would not venture to prescribe, not knowing with what shot the patient had been wounded. McLaren died, and about the same time his cattle were hoffed and his livestock destroyed in a barbarous manner. Robin Oig, after this feat, which one of his biographers represents as the unhappy discharge of a gun, retired to his mother's house, to boast that he had drawn the first blood in the quarrel aforesaid. On the approach of troops and a body of the Stuarts, who were bound to take up the cause of their tenant, Robin Oig absconded and escaped all search. The doctor, already mentioned by name of Callum McInleister, with James and Ronald, brothers to the actual perpetrator of the murder, were brought to trial. But as they contrived to represent the action as a rash deed committed by the daft callant Rob, to which they were not accessory, the jury found their accession to the crime was not proven. The alleged acts of spoil and violence on the McLaren's cattle were also found to be unsupported by evidence. As it was proved, however, that the two brothers, Ronald and James, were held and reputed thieves, they were appointed to find caution to the extent of two hundred pounds for their good behavior for seven years. Note D. Author's Expedition Against the McLarens The spirit of clanship was at that time so strong, to which must be added the wish to secure the adherence of stout, able-bodied, and, as the Scotch phrase then went, pretty men, that the representative of the noble family of Perth condescended to act openly as patron of the MacGregors and appeared as such upon their trial. So at least the author was informed by the late Robert McIntosh, Esquire, Advocate. The circumstances may, however, have occurred later than 1736, the year in which this first trial took place. Robin Oig served for a time in the 42nd Regiment, and was present at the Battle of Fontenoy, where he was made prisoner and wounded. He was exchanged, returned to Scotland, and obtained his discharge. He afterwards appeared openly in the MacGregor's country, and, notwithstanding his outlawry, married a daughter of Graham of Drunkey, a gentleman of some property. His wife died a few years afterwards. The insurrection of 1745, soon afterwards, called the MacGregor's to arms. Robert MacGregor of Glencarnock, generally regarded as the chief of the whole name, and grandfather of Sir John, whom the clan received in that character, raised a MacGregor regiment with which he joined the standard of the Chevalier. The race of Sir Moore, however, affecting independence, and commanded by Glen Gyle and his cousin James Roy MacGregor, did not join this kindred corps, but united themselves to the levies of the titular Duke of Perth, until William MacGregor Drummond of Bolhaldi, whom they regarded as head of their branch of Clan Alpine, should come over from France. To cement the Union after the Highland fashion, James laid down the name of Campbell, and assumed that of Drummond, in compliment to Lord Perth. He was also called James Roy, after his father, and James Moore, or Big James, from his height. His corps, the relics of his father's Rob's band, behaved with great activity. With only twelve men he succeeded in surprising and burning, for the second time, the fort at Inversnaid, constructed for the express purpose of bridling the country of the MacGregors. What rank or command James MacGregor had is uncertain. He calls himself Major, and Chevalier Johnstone calls him Captain. He must have held rank under Glendu, his kinsman, but his active and audacious character placed him above the rest of his brethren. Many of his followers were unarmed. He supplied the want of guns and swords with side-blades set straight upon their handles. At the Battle of Preston Pans, James Roy distinguished himself. His company, said Chevalier Johnston, did great execution with their size. They cut the legs of the horses in two, the rider through the middle of their bodies. MacGregor was brave and intrepid, but at the same time somewhat whimsical and singular. When advancing to the charge with his company, he received five wounds, two of them from balls that pierced his body through and through. Stretched on the ground, with his head resting on his hand, he called out loudly to the highlanders of his company, my lads, I'm not dead, by God. I shall see if any of you does not do his duty. The victory, as is well known, was instantly obtained. In some curious letters of James Roy, published in Blackwood's Magazine, Volume 2, page 228, 
it appears that his thigh-bone was broken on this occasion, and that he, nevertheless, rejoined the army with six companies, and was present at the Battle of Culloden. After that defeat the clan MacGregor kept together in a body, and did not disperse till they had returned into their own country. They brought James Roy with them in a litter, and without being particularly molested, he was permitted to reside in the MacGregor's country along with his brothers. James MacGregor Drummond was attainted for high treason with persons of more importance, but it appears he had entered into some communication with government, as in the letters quoted he mentions having obtained a pass from the Lord Justice Clark in 1747, which was a sufficient protection to him from the military. The circumstance is obscurely stated in one of the letters already quoted, but may perhaps, joined to subsequent incidents, authorize the suspicion that James, like his father, could look at both sides of the cards. As the confusion of the country subsided, the MacGregors, like foxes which had baffled the hounds, drew back to their old haunts, and lived unmolested. But an atrocious outrage, in which the sons of Rob Roy were concerned, brought at length on the family the full vengeance of the law. James Roy was a married man, and had fourteen children, but his brother, Robin Oig, was now a widower, and it was resolved, if possible, that he should make his fortune by carrying off and marrying, by force if necessary, some woman of fortune from the lowlands. The imagination of the half-civilized Highlanders was less shocked at the idea of this particular species of violence than might be expected from their general kindness to the weaker sex when they make part of their own families. But all their views were tinged with the idea that they lived in a state of war, and in such a state, from the time of the siege of Troy to the moment when Pervisa fell, Child Harold's Pilgrimage Canto II, the wealthy are slaughtered, the lovely are spared. The female captives are, to uncivilized victors, the most valuable part of the booty. We need not refer to the rape of Sabines or to a similar instance in the Book of Judges, for evidence that such deeds of violence have been committed upon a large scale. Indeed, this sort of enterprise was so common among the Highland line as to give rise to a variety of songs and ballads. See Appendix Number 6. The annals of Ireland, as well as those of Scotland, prove the crime to have been common in the more lawless parts of both countries, and any woman who happened to please a man of spirit, who came of a good house, and possessed a few chosen friends and a retreat in the mountains, was not permitted the alternative of saying him nay. What is more, it would seem, that the women themselves most interested in the immunities of their sex were among the lower classes accustomed to regard such marriages as that which is presently to be detailed as pretty Fanny's way, or rather the way of Donald with pretty Fanny. It is not a great many years since a respectable woman above the lower rank of life expressed herself very warmly to the author on his taking the freedom to censure the behavior of the MacGregors on the occasion in question. She said that there was no use in giving a bride too much choice upon such occasions that the marriages were the happiest long sign which had been done offhand. Finally, she averred that her own mother had never seen her father till the night he brought her up from the Lennox with ten head of black cattle, and there had not been a happier couple in the country. James Drummond and his brethren, having similar opinions with the author's old acquaintance, and debating how they might raise the fallen fortunes of their clan, formed a resolution to settle their brother's fortune by striking up an adventitious marriage bewixt Robin Oig and one Jean Key, or Wright, a young woman scarce twenty years old, and who had been left about two months a widow by the death of her husband. Her property was estimated at only from 16,000 to 18,000 merks, but it is seen to have been sufficient temptation to these men to join in the commission of a great crime. This poor young victim lived with her mother in her own house at Indinbilly in the parish of Balfron and Shire of Stirling. At this place, in the night of 3rd December, 1750, 
the sons of Rob Roy, and particularly James Mohar and Robert Oig, rushed into the house where the object of their attack was resident, presented guns, swords, and pistols to the males of the family, and terrified the woman by threatening to break open the doors if Jean Key was not surrendered. As said James Roy, his brother was a young fellow determined to make his fortune, having at length dragged the object of their lawless purpose from her place of concealment. They tore her from her mother's arms, mounted her on a horse before one of the gang, and carried her off in spite of her screams and cries, which were long heard after the terrified spectators of the outrage could no longer see the party retreat through the darkness in her attempts to escape the poor young woman threw herself from the horse on which they had placed her and in so doing wrenched her side they then laid her double over the pommel of the saddle and transported her through the mosses and moors till the pain of the injury she had suffered in her side augmented by the uneasiness of her posture made her consent to sit upright in the execution of this crime they stopped at more houses than one, but none of the inhabitants dared to interrupt their proceedings. Amongst others who saw them was that classical and accomplished scholar, the late professor, William Richardson of Glasgow, who used to describe as a terrible dream their violent and noisy entrance into the house where he was then reciting. The Highlanders filled the little kitchen, brandishing their arms, demanding what they had pleased and receiving whatever they were demanded. James Moore, he said, was a tall, stern, and soldier-like man. Robert Og looked more gentle, dark, but then ruddy in complexion. A good-looking young savage, their victim was so disheveled in her dress and forlorn in her appearance and demeanor that he could hardly tell whether she was alive or dead. The gang carried the unfortunate woman to Waridan, where they had a priest unscrupulous enough to read the marriage surface, while James Moore forcibly held the bride up before him, and the priest declared the couple man and wife. Even while she protested against the infamy of his conduct, under the same threats of violence which had been all along used to enforce their scheme, the poor victim was compelled to reside with the pretend husband who was thus forced upon her. They even dared to carry her into the public church of Balculader, where the officiating clergyman, the same who had been Rob Roy's pensioner, only asked them if they were married persons. Robert MacGregor answered in the affirmative. The terrified female was silent. The country was now too effectually subjected to the law for this vile outrage to be followed by the adventurous proposed by the actors. Military parties were sent out in every direction to seize MacGregors, who were for two or three weeks compelled to shift from one place to another in the mountains bearing the unfortunate Jean Key along with them. In the meanwhile, the Supreme Civil Court issued a warrant subquestrating the property of Jean Key or Wright which removed out of the reach of the actors in the violence the prize which they expected. They had, however, adopted a belief of the poor woman's spirit, being so far broken that she would prefer submitting to her condition and adhering to Robin Org as her husband, rather than incur the disgrace of appearing in such a cause in an open court. It was, indeed, a delicate experiment, but their kinsman Glengsvile, chief of their immediate family, was of a temper adverse to lawless proceedings, and the captive friends, having had recourse to this advice, they feared that he would withdraw his protection if they refused to place the prisoner at liberty. Such, at least, was his general character, for when James Moore, while perpetrating the violence at Edinbilly, called out in order to overawe opposition, that Glengsvile was lying in the moor with a hundred men to patronize his enterprise. Jean Key told him he lied, since he was confident Glengsvile would never countenance so scoundrelly a business. The brethren resolved, therefore, to liberate the unhappy woman, but previously had recourse to every measure which should oblige her. 
either from fear or otherwise, to own her marriage with Robert Org, the Kaliaks, old Highland hags, administered drugs which were designed to have the effect of philtres, but were probably deteriorous. James Moore at one time threatened that if she did not acquiesce in the match she would find that there were enough of men in the highlands to bring the heads of two of her uncles who were pursuing the civil lawsuit. At another time he fell down on his knees and confessed he had been accessory to wronging her, but begged. He would not ruin his innocent wife and large family. She was made to swear she would not prosecute the brethren for the offense they had committed, and she was obliged by threats to subscribe papers which were tendered to her, imitating that she was carried off in consequence of her own previous request. James Moore, Drummond accordingly, brought his pretended sister-in-law to Edinburgh, where for some little time she was carried about from one house to another, watched by those with whom she was lodged, and never permitted to go out alone or even to approach the window. The court of session, considering the peculiarity of the case, and regarding Jean Key as being still under some forcible restraint, took her person under her their own special charge and appointed her to reside in the family of Mr. Whiteman of Maldsley, a gentleman of respectably, who was married to one of her near relatives. Two centennials kept guard on their house day and night, a precaution not deemed superfluous. When the McGregors were in question, she was allowed to go out whenever she chose, and to see whoever she had a mind as well as the men of law employed in the civil suit on either side. When she first came to Mr. Whiteman's house, she, came, she seemed broken down with a fright and suffering, so changed in features that her mother hardly knew her, and so shaken in mind that she scarce could recognize her parent. It was long before she could be assured that she was in perfect safety, but when she at length received confidence in her situation, she made a judicial declaration, or a fit of it, telling the full history of her wrongs, imputing to fear her former silence on the subject, and expressing her, her resolution not to prosecute those who had injured her, in respect of the oath she had been compelled to take. From the possible breach of such an oath, through a compulsory one, she was relieved by the forms of Scottish jurisprudence, in that respect more equitable than those of England, prosecutors for crimes being always conducted at the expense and in charge of the king without inconvenience or cost to the private party who has sustained the wrong, but the unhappy sufferer did not live to be either accuser or witness against those who had so deeply injured her. James Moore Drummond had left Edinburgh so soon as his half-dead prey had been taken from his clutches. Mrs. Key or Ray was released from her species of confinement there and removed to Glasgow, under the escort of Mr. Whiteman. As they passed the hill of shots, her escort changed to say, This is a very wild spot. What if MacGregor should come upon us? God forbid, was her immediate answer. The very sight of them would kill me. She continued to reside at Glasgow without venturing to return to her own house at Edinbilly. Her pretended husband made some attempts to obtain the interview with her, which she steadily rejected. She died on the 4th of October, 1751. The information for the crown hints her decease might be the consequence of the usage she received, but there is a general report that she died of the smallpox. In meantime, James Moore, or Drummond, fell into the hands of justice. He was considered as the instigator of the whole affair. Nay, the decreased had informed her friends that on the night of her being carried off, Robin Oig, moved by her cries and tears, had partly consented to let her return. When James came up with the pistol in his hand, and asking whether he has such a coward as to relinquish an enterprise in which he had risked everything to procure him a fortune, in a matter compelled his brother to preserve, James's trial took place on the 13th of July, 1752, and was conducted with the most utmost fairness and impartiality. 
Several witnesses, all of the McGregor family, swore that the marriage was performed with every appearance of acquaintance on the woman's part. And three or four witnesses, one of them sheriff's substitute of the country, swore she might have made her escape if she wished. And the magistrate stared away they offered her assistance, if she felt desirous to do so. But when asked why she in the official capacity did not arrest the McGregors, he could only answer that had not forced sufficient to make the attempt. The judicial declaration of Jean Key or Wright stated the violent matter in which she had been carried off, and they were confirmed by many of her friends from her private communications with them, which the event of her death rendered good evidence. Indeed, the fact of her abduction, to use a Scottish law term, was completely proved by impartial witnesses. The unhappy woman admitted that she had pretended acquiescence in her fate on several occasions, because she dared not to trust such as offered to assist her to escape, not even the sheriff's substitute. The jury brought in a special verdict, finding that Jean Key or Wright had been forcibly carried off from her house, as charged in the indictment, and that the accused had failed to show that she was herself privy and consenting to the act of outrage, but they found the forcible marriage and subsequent violence was not proved, and also found an alleviation of the panel's guilt in the premises that Jean Key did acquiesce in her condition. Eleven of the jury, using the names of other four who were absent, subscribed a letter to the court stating that it was their purpose and desire, by such special verdict, to take the panel's case out of the class of capital crimes. Learned informations, written arguments, on the import of the verdict, which must be allowed a very mild one in the circumstances, were laid before the High Court of Justicary. This point is very learnedly debated in these pleadings by Mr. Grant, solicitor for the Crown and for celebrated Mr. Lockhart, on the part of the prisoner, but James Moore did not wait the event of the court's decision. He had been committed to the castle of Edinburgh on some reports that an escape would be attempted, yet he contrived to achieve his liberty even from that fortress. His daughter had the address to enter the prison, disguised as a cobbler, bringing home work as she pretended. In this cobbler's dress, her father quickly arrayed himself. The wife and daughter of the prisoner were heard by the centennial scolding the supposed cobbler for having done his work ill, and the man came out with his hat slouched over his eyes and grumbling, as if the manner in which they had treated him. In this way the prisoner passed all the guards without suspicion and made his escape to France. He was afterwards outlawed by the court of Justicary, which proceeded to the trial of Duncan MacGregor, or Drummond, his brother, 15th of January, 1753. The accused had unquestionably been with the party which carried off Jean Key, but no evidence being brought which applied to him individually and directly, the jury found him not guilty, and nothing more is known of his fate. That of James MacGregor, who, from talented and activity, if not by seniority, may be considered as head of the family, has been a long misrepresented, as it been generally arrived in the law reports, as well as elsewhere, that his outlawry was reversed, and that he returned and died in Scotland. But the curious letters published in Blackwood's magazine for December 1817 show this to be an error the first of these documents is a petition to Charles Edward. It is dated 20th of September, 1753, and pleads a service to the cause of the Stuarts, ascribing his exile to the persecution of the Hanoverian government without any allusion to the affair of Jean Key or the court of Justicary. It is stated to be forwarded by MacGregor Drummond of Bahaldy, whom, as before mentioned, James Moore acknowledged as his chief. The effect which this petition produced does not appear. Some temporary relief was perhaps obtained, 
but soon after the daring adventurer was engaged in a very dark intrigue against an exile of his own country, and placed pretty nearly in his own circumstances. A remarkable Highland story must be here briefly alluded to Mr. Campbell of Glenure, who had been named factor for government on the forfeited estates of Stuart of Ardishell, which was shot dead by an assassin as he passed through the wood of Lettermore. After crossing the ferry of Belichulish, a gentleman named James Stewart, a natural brother of Ardshell, the forfeited person was tried as being accessory to the murder, and condemned and executed upon very doubtful evidence, the heaviest part of which only amounted to the accused person having assisted a nephew of his own, called Alan Breck Stewart, with money to escape after the dead was gone. Not satisfied with his vengeance, which was obtained in the matter little of the honor of the dispensation of justice at the time, the friends of the deceased, Glenure, were equally desirous to obtain possession of the person of Alan Breck Stewart, supposed to be the actual homicide James Moore Drummond, was secretly applied to to trep on Stewart to the sea coast and bring him over to Britain to almost certain death. Drum and MacGregor had kindred connections with the slain Glenure, and besides, the MacGregors and Campbells had been friends of late, while the former clan and the Stuarts had, as we have seen, been recently at feud. Lastly, Robert Oog was now in custody of Edinburgh, and James was desirous to do some service by which his brother might be saved. The joint force of which this motive may, in James estimation of right and wrong have been some vindication for engaging in such an enterprise although as much be necessary sup supposed it could only be executed by treachery of a gross description macgregor stipulated for a license to return to england promising to bring alan breck thither among with him but the intended victim was to put upon his guard by two countrymen who suspected James' intentions toward him. He escaped from his kidnapper, after, as MacGregor alleged, wrapping his portmanteau of some clothes in four snuff-boxes, such as a charge, it may be observed, could scarce have been made unless the parties had been living on a footing of intimacy and had access to each other's baggage. Although James Drummond had thus missed his blow in the matter of Alan Breck Stewart, he used his license to make a journey to London, and had an interview, as he avers, with Lord Holderness. His lordship and his under-secretary put many puzzling questions to him, and as he says offered him a situation which would bring him bread in the government service. This office was advantageous as to in the moment, but the opinion of James Trenmond, his acceptance of it would have been a disgrace to his birth and have rendered him a scourge to his country if such a tempting offer and sturdy rejection had any foundation in fact it probably relates to some plan of espionage on the jacobites which the government might hope to carry on by means of a man who in the matter of alan breck stewart had shown no great nicety of feeling drummond macgregor was so far accommodating as to intimate with his willingness to act in any station in which other gentlemen of honor served, but not otherwise, an answer which, compared with some passages of his past life, may remind the reader of ancient pistols standing upon his reputation. Having thus proved intractable, as he tells the story to the proposals of Lord Holderness, James Drummond was ordered instantly to quit England, on his return to France, his condition seems to have been utterly disastrous. He was seized with fever and gravel, ill consequently in body, and weakened and dispirited in mind. Alan Breck Stewart threatened to put him to death in revenge of the designs he had harbored against him. Note E. Alan Breck Stewart. The Stewart clan were in the highest degree unfriendly to him and his late expedition to London had been attended with many suspicious circumstances, amongst which it was not the slightest, and that he had kept his purpose secret from his chief, Bohaldi, 
His intercourse with Lord Holderness was suspicious. The Jacobites were probably like Don Bernard de Castel Blaise in Gil Blas, the little disposed to like whose who kept company with Algazils, MacDonald of Loughgarry, a man of unquestioned honor, lodged an information against James Drummond before the high valley of Dunkirk, accusing him of being a spy so that he found himself obliged to leave that town and come to Paris, with only the sum of certain livers subsistence, and with absolute beggary staring at him, staring him in the face. We do not offer the convicted common thief the accomplice in MacLaurin's assassination, or the manager of the outrage against Jean Key as an object of sympathy, melancholy, to look on the dying struggles, even of a wolf or a tiger, creatures of a species directly hostile to our own, and in like manner the utter distress of this man, whose faults may have sprung from a wild system of education, working on a haughty temper, will not be pursued without some pity. In his last letter to Bahaldi, dated Paris, 25th of September, 1754, he describes his state of destitution as absolute, and expresses himself willing to exercise his talents in breaking or breeding horses, or as a hunter or fowler, if he could only procure employment in such an inferior capacity till something better should occur. An Englishman may smile, but a Scotchman will sigh at this postscript, in which the poor starving exile asked the loan of his patron's bagpipes, that he might play over some of the melancholy tunes of his own land. But the effect of music arises, in a great degree from association, and sounds which might jar the nerves of a Londoner or Parisian bring back to the Highlander his lofty mountain, wild lake, and the deeds of his fathers of the Glen. To prove MacGregor's claim to our reader's compassion, we here insert the last part of the letter alluded to. By all appearance I am born to suffer crosses, and it seems they're not at the end. For such is my wretched case at present, that I do not know earthly where to go or what to do, that I have no subsistence to keep body and soul together. All that I have carried here is about thirteen livres, and have taken a room at my old quarters in Hotel St. Piri. Rue de Cordier, I send you the bearer, begging of you to let me know, if you are in that town soon, that I may have pleasure of seeing you, for I have none to make application to, but you alone." And all I want is, if it was possible, you could contrive where I could be employed without going to enter Beckery. This probably is a difficult point, yet unless it's attended with some difficulty, you might think nothing of it, as your long head can bring about matters of much more difficulty and consequence than this. If you disclose this matter to your friend, Mr. Butler, it's possible he might have some employ wherein I could be of use, as I pretend to know as much of breeding and riding of horse as any in France, besides that I am good hunter either on horseback or by footing. You may judge my reduction, as I propose the meanest things to lend a turn, till better cast up. I am sorry that I am obliged to give you so much trouble, but I hope you are very well assured that I am grateful for what you have done for me and I leave you to judge of my present wretched case I am, and shall forever continue, dear chief, your own to command, Jazz MacGregor. Postscript. If you send your pipes by the bearer, and all the other little trinkums belonging to it, I would put them in order, and play some melancholy tunes, which I may now, with safety and in real truth, forgive my not going directly to you, for if I could have borne the seeing of yourself, I could not choose to be seen by my friends in my wretchedness, nor by any of my acquaintance. While MacGregor wrote in this disconsolate manner, death, the sad but sure renemy for mortal evils and decider of all doubts and uncertainty, was hovering near him. A memorandum on the back of the letter says the writer died about a week after, in October 1754. It now remains to mention the fate of Robin Oig, 
for other reasons of Rob Roy seemed to have been no way distinguished. Robin was apprehended by a party of military from the fort of Ivernessade, at the foot of Guatmore, and was converted to Edinburgh 26th of May, 1753. After a delay which may have been protracted by the negotiations of James for delivering up Alan Breck Stewart upon promise of his brother's life, Robin Uig on the 24th of December, 1753, was brought up to the bar of the High Court of Justicary, indicted by the name of Robert MacGregor, alias Campbell, alias Drummond, and alias Robert Uig, and the evidence led against him resembled exactly that which was brought by the clown on the formal trial. Robert's case was in some degree more favorable than his brother's, for though the principal in the forcible marriage, he had yet to plead that he had shown symptoms of relenting, while they were carrying Jean Key off, which were silenced by the remonstrances and the threats of his harder natured brother James. A considerable space of time had also elapsed since the poor woman died, which is always a strong circumstance in favor of the accused, for there is a sort of perspective in guilt, and crimes of an old date seem less odious than those of recent occurrence, but notwithstanding those considerations, the jury in Robert's case did not express any solicitude to save his life as they had done that of James. They found him guilty of being art and part in the forcible abduction of Jean Key from her own dwelling. The trials of the sons of Rob Roy, with antidotes of himself and family, were published at Edinburgh, 1818, in the twelfth month. Robin Oog was condemned to death and executed on the 14th of February, 1754. At the place of execution, he behaved with great decency, and professing himself a Catholic, imputed all his misfortunes to his swerving from the true church. Two or three years before, he confessed the violent methods he had used to gain Mrs. Key or Wright, and hoped his fate would stop further proceedings against his brother James. James died near three months before, but his family might easily remain a long time without the news of that event. The newspapers observed that his body, after hanging the usual time, was delivered to his friends to be carried to the highlands. To this the recollection of a venerable friend, recently taken from us in the fullness of years, than a schoolboy at Lithengau enables the author to add a much larger body of MacGregors than had carried to advance to Edinburgh, received the corpse at that place with the cordonach and other wild emblems of highland mourning, and so escorted it to Belquitter. Thus we may conclude this long account of Rob Roy and his family with the classic phrase, Aitz conclamantum est. I have only to add that I have selected the above from many antidotes of Rob Roy which were, and may still be, current among the mountains where he flourished. But I am far from warranting their exact authenticity. Clannish partialties were very apt to guide the tongue and pen, as well as the pistol and claymore, and the features of an antidote are wonderfully softened or exaggerated as the story is told by a MacGregor or a Campbell. Appendix to Introduction Number 1 Advertisement for the Apprehension of Rob Roy From the Edinburgh Evening Courant, June 18th to June 21st, A.D. 1732, Number 1058 That Robert Campbell, commonly known by the name of Rob Roy MacGregor, being lately entrusted by several noblemen and gentlemen with considerable sums for buying cows for them in the highlands, has treacherously gone off with the money to the value of L-1000 sterling, which he carries along with him. All magistrates and officers of the Majesty's forces are entreated to seize upon the said Rob Roy and the money which he carries with him until the persons concerned in the money he heard against him, and that notice to be given, when he is apprehended to the keepers of the exchange coffee-house at Edinburgh, and the keeper of the coffee-house at Glasgow, where the parties concerned will be advertised, and the Caesars shall be very reasonably rewarded for their plans. It is unfortunate that this hue and cry, which is afterwards repeated in the same paper, 
contains no description of Rob Roy's person, which of course we much suppose to have been pretty generally known, as it is directed against Rob Roy personality. Personally, it would seem to exclude the idea of the cattle being carried off by his partner, MacDonald, who would certainly have been mentioned in the advertisement, if the creditors concerned had supposed him to be in possession of the money. Letters From and to the Duke of Montrose respecting Rob Roy's arrest of Mr. Graham of Killearn. The Duke of Montrose to... It does not appear to whom this letter was addressed, certainly from its style and tenor. It was designed for some person of high rank and office, perhaps the king's advocate for the time. Dated Glasgow, the 21st of November, 1716. My lord, I was surprised last night with the account of a very remarkable instance of the insolence of that very notorious rogue, Rob Roy, whom your lordship has often heard named. The honour of His Majesty's government being concerned in it, I thought it my duty to acquaint your lordship of the particulars by an express. Mr. Graham of Killearn, whom I have had occasion to mention frequently to you, for the good service he did last winter during the rebellion, having the charge of my highland estate, went to Monteith, which is a part of it, on Monday last, to bring in my rents, it being usual for him to be there for two or three nights together at this time of the year, in a country house, for the conveniency of meeting the tenants upon that account. The same night, about nine of the clock, Rob Roy, with a party of those ruffians whom he still keeps about him, and has since the last rebellion, surrounded the house where Mr. Graham was, with some of my tenants doing his business, ordered his men to present their guns in at the windows of the room where he was sitting, while he himself at the same time with others entered at the door with cocked pistols, and made Mr. Graham prisoner, carrying him away to the hills with the money he had got, his books and papers, and my tenant's bonds for their fines, amounting to above a thousand pounds sterling, where the one half had been paid last year, and the other was to have been paid now, and at the same time had the insolence to cause him to write a letter to me, the copy of which is enclosed, offering me terms of a treaty. That your lordship may have the better view of this matter, it will be necessary that I should inform you that this fellow has now, of a long time, put himself at the head of the clan MacGregor, a race of people who in all ages have distinguished themselves beyond others by robberies, depredations, and murders, and have been the constant harbourers and entertainers of vagabonds and loose people. From the time of the revolution he has taken every opportunity to appear against the government, acting rather as a robber than doing any real service to those whom he pretended to appear for, and has really done more mischief to the country than all the other highlanders have done. Some three or four years before the last rebellion broke out, being overburdened with debts, he quitted his ordinary residence, and removed some twelve or sixteen miles farther into the highlands, putting himself under the protection of the Earl of Bredelbin. When my lord Cadogan was in the highlands, he ordered his house at this place to be burnt, which your lordship sees he now places to my account. This obliges him to return to the same country he went from, being a most rugged, inaccessible place, where he took up his residence and knew amongst his own friends and relations, but well judging that it was possible to surprise him, he, with about forty-five of his followers, went to Inverary, made a sham surrender of their arms to Colonel Campbell of Finab, commander of one of the independent companies, and returned home with his men, each of them having the colonel's protection. This happened in the beginning of summer last, yet not long after he appeared with his men twice in arms, in opposition to the king's troops, and one of those times attacked them, rescued a prisoner from them, and all this while sent abroad his party through the country, plundering the country people, and amongst the rest, some of my tenants. Being informed of these disorders after I came to Scotland, I applied to Lieutenant General Carpenter, who ordered three parties from Glasgow, Stirling, and Finlaric, to march in the night by different routes in order to surprise him and his men in their houses, which would have its effect certainly if the great rains that happened to fall that very night had not retarded the march of the troops so as some of the parties came too late to the stations that they were ordered for. All that could be done upon the occasion was to burn a country house where Rob Roy then resided, after some of his clan had from the rocks fired upon the king's troops, by which a grenadier was killed. Mr. Graham of Killearn, being my deputy sheriff in that country, went along with the party that marched from Stirling, 
and doubtless will now meet with the worst treatment from that barbarous people on that account. Besides that he is my relation, and that they know how active he has been in the service of the government, all which your lordship may believe puts me under very great concern for the gentleman, while at the same time I can foresee no manner of way how to relieve him, other than to leave him to chance and his own management. I had my thoughts before of proposing to government the building of some barracks, as the only expedient for suppressing these rebels, and securing the peace of the country. In that view I spoke to General Carpenter, who has now a scheme of it in his hands, and I am persuaded that will be the true method of restraining them effectually, but in the meantime it will be necessary to lodge some of the troops in those places, upon which I intend to write to the general. I am sensible I have troubled your lordship with a very long letter, which I should be ashamed of, were I myself singly concerned. But where the honour of the king's government is touched, I need make no apology, and I shall only beg leave to add that I am, with great respect and truth, my lord, your lord's most humble and obedient servant, Montrose. Copy of Graham of Killearn's letter enclosed in the preceding. Chavalarac, November 19th, 1716. May it please your grace, I am obliged to give your grace the trouble of this by Robert Roy's commands, being so unfortunate at present as to be his prisoner. I refer the way and manner I was apprehended to the bearer, and shall only in short acquaint your grace with the demands, which are that your grace shall discharge him of all sums he owes your grace, and give him the sum of thirty-four hundred marks for his loss and damages, sustained by him, both at Craigros Town and at his house, Achengasalan, and that your grace shall give your word not to trouble or prosecute him afterwards, till which time he carries me all the money I received this day, my books and bonds for interest, not yet paid, along with him, with assurance of hard usage, if any party are sent after him. The sum I received this day, conformed to the nearest computation I can make before several of the gentlemen, is three thousand two hundred twenty-seven pounds, two shillings, eightpence, Scots, of which I gave them notes. I shall wait your grace's return, and ever am, your grace's most obedient, faithful, humble servant, six subscripturer, John Graham. The Duke of Montrose to Unknown, dated 28th November, 1716, Killearn's Release. Glasgow, 28th November, 1716. Sir, having acquainted you by my last of the twenty-first instant of what had happened to my friend Mr. Graham of Killearn, I am very glad now to tell you that last night I was very agreeably surprised with Mr. Graham's coming here himself, and giving me the first account I had had of him from the time of his being carried away. It seems Rob Roy, when he came to consider a little better of it, found that he could not mend his matters by retaining Killearn his prisoner, which could only expose him still the more to the justice of the government, and therefore thought fit to dismiss him on Sunday evening last, having kept him from the Monday night before, under a very uneasy kind of restraint, being obliged to change continually from place to place. He gave him back the books, papers, and bonds, but kept the money. I am with great truth, sir, your most humble servant, Montrose. Some papers connected with Rob Roy MacGregor, signed Roe Campbell, in 1711, were lately presented to the Society of Antiquaries. One of these is a kind of contract between the Duke of Montrose and Rob Roy, by which the latter undertakes to deliver within a given time sixty good and sufficient Kintail Highland cows, betwixt the age of five and nine years, at fourteen pounds Scots per piece, with an bull to the bargain, and that at the head dykes of Buchanan upon the twenty-eighth day of May next, dated December 1711. See Proceedings, Volume 7, page 253. Number 3. Challenge by Rob Roy Rob Roy to ain high and mighty Prince James, Duke of Montrose. In charity to your grace's courage and conduct, please know the only way to retrieve both is to treat Rob Roy like himself, in appointing time, place, and choice of arms, that at once you may extirpate your inveterate enemy, or put a period to your puny life in failing gloriously by his hands. That impertinent critics or flatterers may not brand me for challenging a man that's repute of a poor dastardly soul. Let such know that I admit of the two great supporters of his character, and the captain of his bands, to join with him in the combat. Then sure your grace won't have the impudence to clamour at court for multitudes to hunt me like a fox. 
under pretense that I am not to be found above ground. This saves your grace and the troops any further trouble of searching. That is, if your ambition of glory press you to embrace the unequalled venture offered of Rob's head. But if your grace's piety, prudence, and cowardice forbids hazarding this gentlemanly expedient, then let your desire of peace restore what you have robbed from me by the tyranny of your present situation. Otherwise your overthrow as a man is determined, and advertise your friends never more to look for the frequent civility paid them, of sending them home without their arms only. Even their former cravings won't purchase that favor. So your grace by this has peace in your offer, if the sound of wax be frightful and choose you will, your good friend or mortal enemy. This singular rhodomontade is enclosed in a letter to a friend of Rob Roy, probably a retainer of the Duke of Argyle in Isle, which is in these words. Sir, receive the enclosed paper. When you are taking your bottle, it'll divert yourself and comrades. I got no news since I seed you, only that we had before about the Spaniards is likely to continue. If I'll get any further account about them, I'll be sure to let you know of it. Until then I will not write any more till I'll have more sure account. And I am, sir, your most affectionate cousin, and most humble servant, Rob Roy. April 16th, 1719 To Mr. Patrick Anderson at Hades The seal, a stag, no bad emblem of a wild Caterin. It appears from the envelope that Rob Roy still continued to act as intelligencer to the Duke of Argyle and his agents. The war he alludes to is probably some vague report of invasion from Spain. Such rumors were likely enough to be afloat in consequence of the disembarkation of the troops who were taken at Glen Shiel in the preceding year, 1718. Number 4. Letter From Robert Campbell, alias MacGregor, commonly called Rob Roy, to Field Marshal Wade, then receiving the submission of disaffected chieftains and clans. This curious epistle is copied from an authentic narrative of Marshal Wade's proceedings in the Highlands, communicated by the late eminent antiquary George Chalmers, Esquire, to Mr. Robert Jameson of the Register House, Edinburgh, and published in the appendix to an edition of Burt's Letters from the North of Scotland, two volumes, eight folio, Edinburgh, 1818. Sir, the great humanity with which you have constantly acted in the discharge of the trust reposed in you, and your ever having made use of the great powers with which you were vested as the means of doing good and charitable offices to such as you found proper objects of compassion, will I hope excuse my importunity in endeavouring to approve myself not absolutely unworthy of that mercy and favour which your Excellency has so generously procured from His Majesty for others, in my unfortunate circumstances. I am very sensible nothing can be alleged sufficient to excuse so great a crime, as I have been guilty of it, that of rebellion. But I humbly beg leave to lay before Your Excellency some particulars in the circumstance of my guilt, which I hope will extenuate it in some measure. It's my misfortune at the time the rebellion broke out to be liable to legal diligence and caption at the Duke of Montrose's instance for debt alleged to him. To avoid being flung into prison, as I must certainly have been, had I followed my real inclinations in joining the King's troops at Stirling, I was forced to take party with the adherents of the Pretender. For the country being all in arms, it was neither safe nor indeed possible for me to stand neuter. I should not, however, plead my being forced into that unnatural rebellion against His Majesty King George if I could not at the same time assure Your Excellency that I not only avoided acting offensively against His Majesty's forces upon all occasions, but, on the contrary, sent His Grace the Duke of Argyle all the intelligence I could from time to time of the strength and situation of the rebels, which I hope His Grace will do me the justice to acknowledge. As to the debt to the Duke of Montrose, I have discharged it to the utmost farthing. I beg your Excellency would be persuaded that had it been in my power, as it was in my inclination, I should always have acted for the service of His Majesty King George, and that one reason of my begging the favour of your intercession with His Majesty for the pardon of my life is the earnest desire I have to employ it in his service, 
whose goodness, justice, and humanity are so conspicuous to all mankind. I am, with all duty and respect, your Excellency's most humble and obedient servant, Robert Campbell. Number 4A. Letter. Escape of Rob Roy from the Duke of Athol. The following copy of a letter which passed from one clergyman of the Church of Scotland to another was communicated to me by John Gregorson, Esquire, of our Tornish. The escape of Rob Roy is mentioned like other interesting news of the time, with which it is intermingled. The disagreement between the Dukes of Athol and Argyle seems to have animated the former against Rob Roy as one of Argyle's partisans. Reverend and dear brother, yours of the 28th of June I had by the bearer. I am pleased you have got back again your delinquent, which may probably save you of the trouble of a child. I am sorry I have yet very little of certain news to give you from the court, though I have seen all the week's prints, only I find in them a passage which is all the account I can give you of the indemnity. Yet, when the estates of four-faulted rebels comes to be sold, all just debts documented are to be preferred to officers of the court of inquiry. The bill in favours of that court against the Lords of Session in Scotland and past the House of Commons, and come before the Lords, which is thought to be considerably more ample, informally with respect to the disposing of estates, canvassing, and paying of debts. It's said yet the examinations of Cadogan's accounts is dropped, but it wants confirmations here as yet. Oxford's trial should be entered upon Saturday last, we hear that the Duchess of Argyle is with child. I do not hear yet the divisions at court are anything abated, or of any appearance of the Duke's having anything of his major favour. I heartily wish the present humours at court may not prove an encouragement to watchful and restless enemies. My accounts of Rob Roy, his escape, uh, yet after several embassies between his grace, who I hear did correspond with some at court about it, and Rob, he at length, upon promise of protection, came to wait upon the Duke, and, being presently secured, his grace sent post, to Edinburgh to acquaint the court of his being apprehended, and call his friends at Edinburgh, and to desire a party from General Carpenter to receive and bring him to Edinburgh, which party came the length of Ken Ross in Fife. He was to be delivered to them by a party his grace had demanded from the governor at Perth, who then upon their march toward Dunkel to receive him, were met by and returned by his grace, having resolved to deliver him by a party of his own men, and left Rob at Logurate under a strong guard, till yet party could be ready to receive him. This space of time Rob had employed in taking the other dram heartily with the guard, and when all were pretty hearty, Rob is delivering a letter for his wife to a servant, to whom he most needs deliver some private instructions at the door for his wife where he is attended with on the guard. When serious in this private conversation, he is making some few steps carelessly from the door about the house, till he comes close by this horse, which he soon mounted and made off. This is no small mortification to the guard, because of the delay it gives to their hopes of a considerable additional charge against John Roy, i.e. John the Red, John Duke of Argyle, so called for his complexion more commonly styled Red John the Warrior. My wife was upon Thursday last delivered of a son after sore travail, of which she still continues very poorly. I give your lady hearty thanks for the Highland plaid. It's a good cloth, but it does not answer the set I sent some time ago with MacArthur and though it had I told in my last yet, my wife was obliged to provide herself to finish her bed before she was lighted. But I know your letter came not timely to your hand. I am sorry I had not money to send by the bearer, having no thought of it, and being exposed to some little expenses last week. But I expect some sure occasion, when order by a letter to receive it, excuse this freedom. From etc., etc., etc. Mance of Comrie, July 2nd, 1717. I salute your lady. I wish my blank, her daughter, much joy. Number 5. Highland Wooing There are many productions of the Scots ballad poets upon the lion-like mode of wooing practiced by the ancient Highlanders, when they had a fancy for the person or property of a lowland damsel. 
One example is found in Mr. Robert Jameson's popular Scottish songs. Bonnie by the Livingstone gaed out to see the Kay, and she was met with Glen Leon, who has stolen her away. He took free her her satin coat, but on her silken gown, sin round him his tartan plaid, and happed her round and round. In another ballad we're told how four and twenty Heelan men came down by Fittick Bede, and they have sworn a deadly oath, Sheen Maya should be a breed, and they have sworn a deadly oath, Elk men upon his dirk, that she should wed with Duncan Gara, they'd make bloody works. This last we have from tradition, but there are many others in the collections of Scottish ballads to the same purpose. The achievement of Robert Oig, or young Rob Roy, as the lowlands called him, was celebrated in a ballad of which there are twenty different and various editions. The tune is lively and wild, and we select the following words from memory. Rob Roy is frae the highlands come, down to the lowland border, and he has stolen that lady away to haud his horse in order. He set her on a milk-white steed, of none he stood in awe, until they reached the highland hills, aboon the Balmaha. That's a pass on the eastern margin of Loch Lomond, and an entrance to the highlands. Saying, Be content, be content, be content with me, lady. Where will ye find in Lennox land so bra a man as me, lady? Rob Roy he was my father called, MacGregor was his name, lady. Ah, the country far and near have heard MacGregor's fame, lady. He was a hedge about his friends, a heckle to his foes, lady. If any man did him gain, say he felt his deadly blows, lady. I am as bold, I am as bold, I am as bold and more, lady. Any man that doubts my word may try my good claim o'er, lady. Then be content, be content, be content with me, lady. For now you are my wedded wife, till the day you die, lady. Number 6. Gwildu The following notices concerning this chief fell under the author's eye while the sheets were in the act of going through the press. They occur in manuscript memoirs written by a person intimately acquainted with the incidents of 1745. This chief had the important task entrusted to him of defending the castle of Doan, in which the chevalier placed a garrison to protect his communication with the highlands, and to repel any sallies which might be made from Stirling Castle. Glen Du distinguished himself by his good conduct in this charge. Glen Du is thus described. Glen Gyle is, in person, a tall, handsome man, and has more of the mean of the ancient heroes than our modern fine gentlemen are possessed of. He is honest and disinterested to a proverb, extremely modest, brave and intrepid, and born one of the best partisans in Europe. In short, the whole people of that country declared that never did men live under so mild a government as Glen Giles, not a man having so much as lost a chicken while he continued there. It would appear from this curious passage that Glen Gyle, not Stuart of Ballock, as averred in a note on Waverley, commanded the garrison of Doan. Ballock might no doubt succeed MacGregor in the situation. Editor's Introduction to Rob Roy In the magnum opus, the author's final edition of the Waverley novels, Rob Roy appears out of its chronological order, and comes next after the antiquary. In this, as in other matters, the present edition follows that of 1829. The antiquary, as we said, contained in its preface the author's farewell to his art. This valediction was meant as prelude to a fresh appearance in a new disguise. Constable, who had brought out the earlier works, did not publish the Tales of My Landlord, The Black Dwarf and Old Mortality, which Scott had nearly finished by November 12, 1816. The four volumes appeared from the houses of Mr. Murray and Mr. Blackwood, on December 1st, 1816. Within less than a month came out Harold the Dauntless, by the author of The Bridal of Trerarmain. Scott's work on the historical part of the annual register had also been unusually arduous. At Abbotsford, or at Ashdale, his mode of life was particularly healthy. In Edinburgh, between the claims of the courts, of literature, and of society, he was scarcely ever in the open air. Thus hard, sedentary work caused, between 
the publication of Old Mortality and that of Rob Roy, the first of those alarming illnesses which overshadowed the last fifteen years of his life. The earliest attack of cramp in the stomach occurred on March 5th, 1817, when he retired from the room with a scream of agony which electrified his guests. Living on Parrach, as he tells Miss Bailey, for his national spirit rejected arrowroot, Scott had yet energy enough to plan a dramatic piece for Terry, The Doom of Devergoyle, but in April he announced to John Ballantyne a good subject for a novel, and on May 6th, John, after a visit to Abbotsford with Constable, proclaimed to James Ballantyne the advent of Rob Roy. The anecdote about the title is well known. Constable suggested it, and Scott was at first wisely reluctant to write up to a title. Names like Rob Roy, Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, Cleopatra, and so forth, tell the reader too much, and, Scott imagined, often excite hopes which cannot be fulfilled. However, in the geniality of an after-dinner hour in the gardens of Abbotsford, Scott allowed Constable to be sponsor. Many things had lately brought Rob into his mind. In 1812, Scott had acquired Rob Roy's gun, a long Spanish-barreled piece with his initials R.M.C., C standing for Campbell, a name assumed in compliment to the Argyle family. Rob's Spluken had also been presented by Mr. Train to Sir Walter, in 1816, and may have directed his thoughts to this popular freebooter. Though Rob flourished in the fifteen, he was really a character very near Scott, whose friend Invernail had fought Rob with broadsword and target, a courteous combat like that between Ajax and Hector. At Tullibody, Scott had met in 1793 a gentleman who once visited Rob and arranged to pay him blackmail. Mr. William Adam had mentioned to Scott in 1816 the use of the word curly-whirlies for highly decorated architecture, and recognized the phrase next year in the mouth of Andrew Fairservice. In the meeting at Abbotsford, May 2, 1817, Scott was very communicative, sketched Bailey Nicol Jarvie, and improvised a dialogue between Rob and the magistrate. A week later he quoted to Southey Swift's lines, too bad for a blessing, too good for a curse, which probably suggested Andrew Fairservice's final estimate of Scott's hero. Over banned for blessing, and o'er good for banning. These are the trifles which show the bent of Scott's mind at this period. The summer of 1817 he spent in working at the annual register, and at the border antiquities. When the courts rose, he visited Rob's cave at the head of Loch Lomond and this visit seems to have been gossiped about as literary people hearing of the new novel expected the cave to be a very prominent feature he also went to glasgow and refreshed his memory of the cathedral nor did he neglect old books such as a tour through great britain by a gentleman fourth edition seventeen forty eight this yielded him the bailey's account of glasgow commerce in musselburgh stuffs and edinburgh shallons and the phrase sortable cargoes. Hence, too, Scott took the description of the rise of Glasgow. Thus Scott was taking pains with his preparations. The book was not written in post-haste, announced to Constable early in May, the last sheet was not corrected, till about December 21st, when Scott wrote to Ballantyne, Dear James, with great joy I send you Roy. T'was a chop job, but we're done with Rob. Rob Roy was published on the last day of 1817. The toughness of the job was caused by constant pain, and by struggles with the lassitude of opium. So seldom sentimental, so rarely given to expressing his melancholy moods in verse, Scott, while composing Rob Roy, wrote the beautiful poem, The Sun Upon the Weird Law Hill, in which, for this once, pity of self through all makes broken moan. Some stress may be laid on the state of Sir Walter's health at this moment, because a living critic has tried to show that, in his case, every pang of the stomach paralyzes the brain, that he never had a fit of the cramp without spoiling a chapter. Mr. Ruskin's Fiction Fair and Foul, 19th Century, 1880, page 955. Rob Roy is a sufficient answer to these theories. The mind of Scott was no slave to his body. 
The success of the story is pleasantly proved by a sentence in a review of the day. It's an event unprecedented in the annals either of literature or of the Custom House, that the entire cargo of a packet or smack, bound from Leith to London, should be the impression of a novel, for which the public curiosity was so much upon the alert as to require this immense importation to satisfy. Ten thousand copies of a three-volume novel are certainly ponderous cargo, and Constable printed no fewer in his first edition. Scott was assured of his own triumph in February 1819, when a dramatized version of his novel was acted in Edinburgh by the company of Mr. William Murray, a descendant of the traitor Murray of Broughton. Mr. Charles Mackay made a capital bailey, and the piece remains a favorite with Scotch audiences. It's plain from the reviews that in one respect Rob Roy rather disappointed the world. They had expected Rob to be a much more imposing and majestic cataract, and complained that his foot was set too late on his native heather. They found too much of the drover and intriguer, too little of the traditional driver of the spoil. This was what Scott foresaw when he objected to writing up to a title. In fact, he did not write up to it, and, as the Scots magazine said, shaped his story in such a manner as to throw busybodies out in their chase, with a slight degree of malicious finesse. All the expeditions to the wonderful cave have been thrown away, but the said cave is not once, we think, mentioned from beginning to end. Rob Roy equals Waverley in its pictures of Highland and Lowland society and character. Scott had clearly set himself to state his opinions about the Highlands, as they were under the patriarchal system of government. The Highlanders were then a people, not lawless indeed, but all their law was the will of their chief. Bailey Nicol Jarvie makes a statement of their economic and military condition as accurate as it is humorous. The modern Highland question may be studied as well in the Bailey's words as in volumes of history and wildernesses of blue books. A people patriarchal and military as the Arabs of the desert were suddenly dragged into modern commercial and industrial society. All old bonds were snapped in a moment. Emigration, at first opposed by some of the chiefs, and the French wars depleted the country of its long-legged callants, gone wanting the breeks. Cattle took the place of men, sheep of cattle, deer of sheep. And in the long peace a population grew up again, a population destitute of employment even more than of old, because war and robbery had ceased to be outlets for its energy. Some chiefs, as Dr. Johnson said, treated their lands as an attorney treats his row of cheap houses in a town. Hence the Highland question, a question in which Scott's sympathies were with the Highlanders. Rob Roy, naturally, is no mere novel with a purpose, no economic tract in disguise. Among Scott's novels it stands alone as regards its pictures of passionate love. The love of Diana Vernon is no less passionate for its admirable restraint. Here Scott displays, without affectation, a true Greek reserves in his art. The deep and strong affection of Diana Vernon would not have been otherwise handled by him who drew the not more immortal picture of Antigone. Unlike modern novelists, Sir Walter deals neither in analysis nor in rapturous effusions. We can, unfortunately, imagine but too easily how some writers would peep and pry into the concealed emotions of that maiden heart how others would revel in tears, kisses, and caresses. In place of all these, Scott writes, She extended her hand, but I clasped her to my bosom. She sighed as she extricated herself from the embrace which she permitted, escaped to the door which led to her own apartment, and I saw her no more. Months pass in a mist of danger and intrigue before the lovers meet again in the dusk and the solitude. Mr. Francis Osbaldiston, cries the girl's voice through the moonlight, should not whistle his favorite airs when he wishes to remain undiscovered. And Diana Vernon, for she, wrapped in a horseman's cloak, was the last speaker, whistled in playful mimicry the second part of the tune which was on my lips when they came up. Surely there was never, in story or in song, a lady so loving and so light of heart, save Rosalind alone. Her face touches Frank's as she says good-bye forever. 
It was a moment never to be forgotten, inexpressibly bitter, yet mixed with a sensation of pleasure so deeply soothing and affecting as at once to unlock all the floodgates of the heart. She rides into the night. Her lover knows the hysterica passio of poor Lear, but I had scarce given vent to my feelings in this paroxysm ere I was ashamed of my feelings. These were men and women who knew how to love and how to live. All men who read Rob Roy are innocent rivals of Frank Osbaldistone. Di Vernon holds her place in our hearts with Rosalind, and these airy affections, like the actual emotions which they mimic, are not matters for words. This lady, so gay, so brave, so witty and fearless, so tender and true, who endured trials which might have dignified the history of a martyr, who spent the day in darkness and the night in vigil, and never breathed a murmur of weakness or complaint, is as immortal in men's memories as the actual heroine of the White Rose, Flora MacDonald. Her place is with Helen and Antigone, with Rosalind and Imogen, the deathless daughters of dreams. She brightens the world as she passes, and our own hearts tell us all the story, when Osbaldistone says, you know how I lamented her. In the central interest, which for once is the interest of love, Rob Roy attains the nobility, the reserve, the grave dignity of the highest art. It's not easy to believe that Frank Osbaldistone is worthy of his lady, but here no man is a fair judge. In the four novels, Waverley, Guy Mannering, The Antiquary, and Rob Roy, which we have studied, the hero has always been a young poet. Waverly versified. So did Mannering. Lovell had it to a few lyrical pieces, and, and in Osbaldistone's rhymes, Scott parodied his own. Blast of that dread horn on Fontarabian echoes born. All the heroes, then, have been poets, and Osbaldistone's youth may have been suggested by Scott's memories of his own, and of the father who feared that he would never be better than a gangrel scapegoat. Like Henry Morton in Old Mortality, Frank Baldestone is on the political side taken by Scott's judgment, not by his emotions. To make Di Vernon convert him to Jacobitism would have been to repeat the story of Waverley. Still, he would have been more sympathetic if he had been converted. He certainly does not lack spirit as a sportsman, or, on an occasion, as Sir William Hope says in The Scots Fencing Master, when he encounters rashly in the college gardens, Frank, in short, is all that a hero should be, and is glorified by his affection. Of the other characters, perhaps Rob Roy is too sympathetically drawn. The materials for a judgment are afforded by Scott's own admirable historical introduction. The Rob Roy who so calmly played booty, and kept a foot in either camp, certainly falls below the heroic. His language has been criticized in late years, and it's been insisted that the Highlanders never talked lowland scotch. But Scott has anticipated these cavais in the eighteenth chapter of the second volume. Certainly no lowlander knew the Highlanders better than he did, and his ear for dialect was as keen as his musical ear was confessedly obtuse. Scott had the best means of knowing whether Helen MacGregor would be likely to soar into heroics as she is apt to do. In fact, here we may trust the artist. The novel is as rich as any in subordinate characters full of life and humor. Morris is one of the few utter cowards in Scott. He has none of the passionate impulses toward courage of the hapless hero in the fair maid of Perth. The various Osbaldistones are nicely discriminated by Diana Vernon, in one of those Beatrix moods, which Scott did not always admire, when they were displayed by Lady Anne and other girls of flesh and blood. Rashley is of a nature unusual in Scott. He is perhaps Sir Walter's nearest approach, for malignant egotism to an Iago. Of Bailey Nicol Jarvie, commendation were impertinent. All Scotland arose, called him hers, laughed at and applauded her civic child. Concerning Andrew Fairservice, the first edition tells us what the final edition leaves us to guess, that Tresham may recollect him as gardener at Osbaldistone Hall. Andrew was not a friend who could be shaken off. Diana may have ruled the hall, but Andrew must have remained absolute in the gardens with something to maw that he would like to see mawn, or something to saw that he would like to see sawn, or something to ripe that he would like to see ripen. 
and say he ain't dakered, and with a family for a year is end to end, and life's end. His master needed some care for body to look after him. Only Shakespeare and Scott could have given us medicines to make us like this cowardly, conceited, jimp-honest fellow, Andrew Fairservice, who just escapes being a hypocrite by dint of some sincere old covenanting leaven in his veins. We make bold to say that the creator of Paralus and Lucy, and many another lax and lovable knave, would, had he been a Scot, have drawn Andrew Fairservice thus, and not otherwise. The critics of the hour censured, as they were certain to censure the construction, and especially the conclusion of Rob Roy. No doubt the critics were right. In both Scott and Shakespeare there is often seen a perfect disregard of the denouement. Any moderately intelligent person can remark on the huddled-up ends and hasty marriages in many of Shakespeare's comedies. Moliere has been charged with the same offense, and, if blame there be, Scott is almost always to blame. Thackeray is a little better. There must be some reason that explains why men of genius go wrong where every newspaper critic, every milliner's girl acquainted with circulating libraries, can detect the offense. In the closing remarks of Old Mortality, Scott expresses himself humorously on this matter of the denouement. His schoolmaster author takes his proof-sheets to Miss Martha Buskbody, who was the literary set in Ganderclou, having read through the whole stock of three circulating libraries. Miss Buskbody criticizes the Dominic as Lady Louisa Stewart habitually criticized Sir Walter. Your plan of admitting a formal conclusion will never do, the Dominic replied. Really, madam, you must be aware that every volume of a narrative turns less and less interesting as the author draws to a conclusion. Just like your tea, which, though excellent hisson, is necessarily weaker and more insipid in the last cup. He compares the orthodox happy ending to the luscious lump of half-dissolved sugar, usually found at the bottom of the cup. This topic might be discussed, and indeed has been discussed, endlessly. In our actual lives it's probable that most of us have found ourselves living for a year or a month or a week in a chapter or half a volume of a novel, and these have been our least happy experiences. But we have also found that the romance vanishes away like a ghost, dwindles out, closes with ragged ends, and has no denouement. Then the question presents itself, as art is imitation, should not novels, as a rule, close thus? The experiment has frequently been tried, especially by the modern geniuses who do not conceal their belief that their art is altogether finer than Scott's, or perhaps than Shakespeare's. In his practice, and in his Dominie's critical remarks, Sir Walter appears inclined to agree with him. He was just as well aware as his reviewers, or as Lady Louisa Stewart, that the conclusion of Rob Roy is huddled up, that the sudden demise of all the Baldestones is a high-handed measure. He knew that. In real life, Frank and Di Vernon would never have met again after that farewell on the moonlit road, but he yielded to Miss Buskbody's demand for a glimpse of sunshine in the last chapter. He understood the human liking for the final lump of sugar. After all, fiction is not any more than any other art a mere imitation of life. It's an arrangement, a selection. Scott was too kind, too humane, to disappoint us the crowd of human beings who find much of our happiness in dreams. He could not keep up his own interest in his characters after he had developed them. He could take pleasure in giving them life, he had little pleasure in ushering them into an earthly paradise. So that part of his business he did carelessly, as his only rival's literature have also done it. The critics censured, not unjustly, the machinery of the story, these mysterious assets of Osbaldistone and Tresham, whose absence was to precipitate the rising of 1715. The Edinburgh Review lost its heart. Geoffrey's heart was all was being lost to Di Vernon but it pronounces that a king with legs of marble, or a youth with an ivory shoulder, heroes of the Arabian Nights and of Pindar, was probable, compared with the wit and accomplishments of Diana. This is hyper-criticism. Diana's education under Rashley had been elaborate. Her acquaintance with Shakespeare, her main strength, is unusual in women, but not beyond the limits of belief. 
Here she is with an agreeable contrast to Rose Bradwardine, who had never heard of a Romeo and Juliet. In any case, Diana compels belief as well as wins affection, while we are fortunate enough to be in her delightful company. As long as we believe in her, it's not of moment to consider whether her charms are incompatible with probability. Rob Roy was finished in spite of a very bad touch of the cramp for about three weeks in November, which, with its natural attendance of dullness and weakness, made me unable to get our matters forward till last week, says Scott to Constable. But, adds the unconquerable author, I am resting myself here a few days before commencing my new labors, which will be untrodden ground, and, I think, pretty likely to succeed. The new labors were The Heart of Midlothian, this by Andrew Lang. End of Volume 1, Section 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.